Hello everyone, uh, I'm very happy to be here today to moderate uh, this webinar about creative science that we are holding in the Institute of Molecular Science from the University of Valencia. First of all, let me introduce you uh, the Institute of Molecular Science, uh, as we call ISEMOL. The ISEMOL was founded in 2000 by Professor Eugenio Coronado, who is one of the most important chemists and physicists worldwide nowadays. He is also the president of the European Institute of Molecular Magnetism. In the ISEMOL, we work both in the design, in the chemical synthesis, and in the processing of functional molecules, and also in their assembly. Uh, we also study the characterization of these physical and chemical properties, both from a theoretical and from an experimental approach. And we also study the potential applications of these materials. The idea of uh, doing this webinar uh, came from the fact that we saw that there was a general interest in uh, what else is there uh, besides uh, research in academia. Uh, so, because I saw that many colleagues were wondering about this topic, I contacted Fernando Comoyon Bell, who's actually one of our speakers. And I asked him if he would tell me a little bit about his career path. So he, he said, uh, if there is a general interest, as you say, let's propose uh, to the ISMOL to do this webinar. And they were uh, actually very happy about it. Uh, and thanks to the management department and to the communication department, we are today here to bring you different points of view about uh, what is there besides research that we can do as scientists. So uh, there's going to be uh, another series that we will uh, talk about other topics, like it could be project management, uh, marketing, consultancy. But today we're going to talk about the most creative part of science. So there's going to be four speakers, uh, be 25 minutes approximately of each talk, which will be followed by five minutes uh, for questions. So let me introduce you the first speaker of today. Uh, she's not, well, sorry, I forgot to say that at the end of uh, the webinar, there will be as well a uh, short uh, time to ask questions that uh, we could then reply or questions that came came up after the talk. However, uh, this first speaker, Elena gonzalez Buron, uh, won't be for this last part. So please, uh, if you have any question, ask it uh, from the chat. Uh, now we have uh, Raquel Ballesteros uh, in charge of the communication in the ethanol, who is beside, beside the cameras and uh, will be following uh, questions and making sure uh, this works for all of us. So, well, Elena gonzalez Buron uh, has a PhD in biomedicine, and she is the director and the co-founder of Big Bang Science. It's a non-profit organization that aims to communicate science using drama-based activities, uh, humor, and storytelling. Honestly, if you don't follow Big Bang Science on social media, go on and do it now. They are the main reason why I actually have TikTok. So, uh, Elena gonzalez Boudon's job includes being a scientific comedian, science educator, a public communication skills trainer, and also a science writer. She has coordinated and implemented several science educational projects using arts in Europe, Africa, and Latin America. And she is also the author of science education books, such as How to Explain Physics with a Zombie, uh, Quantum Physics with a Zombie Cat. She's the editor as well, and uh, she's an editor and a writer in the National Geographic. Please welcome Elena and uh, get inspired by her. Elena, the, the camera is yours. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Isabel, for, for this introduction. Um, it's an honor for me to be part of this seminar today in which we are going to explore different ways of joining science and creativity. So, I think the first thing I would like to, to do is just to give a very brief introduction about what is Big Bang Science, because I'm here because I'm part of, of this Big Bang thing. So Big Bang Science, thank you Isabel for your introduction. Big Bang Science is a non-profit organization that tries to communicate, in fact, this is our goal, to communicate science to do science engagement to different types of audiences. So we work mainly 
with high school students, it's true, but not only. We have also projects with primary school students and with just general public, so adult people. Um, what is Big Bang and who is inside Big Bang, Big Bang Science? So in Big Bang Science, we are a group of scientists, all of us, uh, or PhD students, or people that has already a PhD. So we are people with a strong background in science, but also with these skills of science communication through performing arts or through audiovisual arts. So it's quite tricky to find people with this profile. Um, we are always recruiting people with this profile, you know, because it's very difficult to find scientists that want to communicate on a stage the science that they do. We started eight years ago, so eight years traveling with the van around the world. Not this year. This year we have been in our houses as everyone else, but is still communicating science through the through different uh, audiovisual materials. Uh, we have several projects. It's true, and all of them are trying to communicate science using performing arts or using some kind of artistic approach. So. Um, uh, I think we can talk about the projects afterwards. I would love to listen to your questions at the end of the of the of this talk because I'm going to talk a little bit about me and my pathway to reach this state of being a scientist, a scientific performer. But of course, I'm sure you are going to have a lot of questions that I would love to to answer. Um, as I said. Um, all of the people, everyone that is involved in this Big Bang Science, in which we have more than 30 collaborators, so 30 scientists that are willing to communicate science on stage. Um, in this Big Bang Science, we believe that it's really important that actual scientists are the ones that can communicate science, because you can have a lot of advantages out of that. So, if you have a strong background in science and you go into the stage and do this kind of performances talking about science and when i'm talking about performances i'm talking about theater stand-up comedy clowning all all these um all these different uh, approaches to do performances when you have a scientist in this situation you can break a lot of stereotypes and this is especially relevant when you are uh, talking or when you are working with high school students because they have all these stereotypes you know about scientists and it's difficult for them to find themselves in these roles of a scientist because you know i'm cool i'm not like this so when you have scientists actual scientists doing these performances you can break a lot of stereotypes so for us it's very important to have people that work in their labs that are doing research uh, helping us or being part of big one science and doing this kind of of communication so uh, I think the next step is talking a little bit about me. So wh why did I choose this pathway? I, well, I, I, I was born in a family of artists, I have to say. To be honest, I'm the only scientist in my family and the second person with a university degree. So you see my family, I didn't grow up in the environment of being a scientist. In fact, something, something happened in my life um, for which I wanted to become a scientist. That is that I watch Jurassic Park with nine years old. This is the most amazing science film in the world. I know some of you are going to disagree with me. I don't mind. I watched uh, Jurassic Park with nine years old. And you know, it was the first time that I saw dinosaurs, of course, but a part of that, that I saw this DNA molecule, this super tiny, minuscule molecule, enough to recreate life. So I was wondering what was in there, inside this molecule that you cannot even see with a microscope. It's, it's, it's even smaller 
what what is happening inside this molecule to be able to rise life so with nine years old 10 years old i started to read a lot of science i read a lot about dna about um, translation proteins uh, all these kind of things so you can imagine i was super nerdy girl in the school and in this high school and i get very involved with with science because of in fact science communication through films at the same time i did a lot of theater so i cannot remember the first time that i step into a stage so i loved theater and i was doing a lot of theater during during the school and during the high school and it's true that my father is a theater director so yes i was very involved in different formats of of theater but at the same time i loved science so i followed these two pathways you know in parallel it was like during the school during the high school even during the university that you can imagine i studied biology molecular biology because I love genetics and DNA because of Jurassic Park. So I, I followed these two pathways and they didn't mix at all during all these years. Um, after the university, I decided to start a PhD, a PhD in biomedicine. So I moved from Salamanca, my hometown, to Barcelona, the Institute for Research in Biomedicine, el IRB, Institut de Recerca Biomedica. And well, I continue to do a lot of theater because it's something, I, it's a need for me to, to feel that I'm alive, <laughs> I need to do theater. So even in Barcelona, I found new groups of theater and I continued with that. And I did a lot of clowning, clown. So I remember the director of this institute that was Joan Guinovart, already know that I was doing this kind of stuff, you know, theater and clowning. And I remember one day uh, in the corridor that he approached and he told me, um, you do a lot of things on, on theater. Have you ever think about joining clown and science? And it was the first time in my life that these two parallel pathways joined together. And I started to think, join clown and science i never thought about this before but it sounds great so i started a very small group called clowntifics together with other guy uh, to start communicating science through clown very uh, easy experiment very visual experiment in a very clownish uh, way so I started to do that during my my PhD and you know uh, in this research center there are always these open days family days so I did this kind of performances clowning during during these days but nothing else and then something happened eight years ago that was that the first fame lab came to Spain um, I don't know if Fame Lab, Fame Lab sounds familiar for you, but Fame Lab is an international contest in which any scientist that wants to take part in this contest can create a short monologue, just three minutes, talking about their research that, that he or she is doing in the lab. So it's just three minutes with an engaging story to communicate what kind of research he or she is doing in the lab and of course i took part in this contest it was it was the second time in my life that i joined theater monologues in this case and science my my two patients joined all together and i discovered there are other people out there with these patients so in this first contest, Fame Lab contest, I met people that changed my life because I met new people that had these two interests that wanted to communicate science on stage. And we decided to create a group. All the finalists in this contest eight years ago created a group that was Big One Science. At the beginning, our name was the Big Van Theory. Van with a V, or Van, Van, Furgoneta, Van. 
Um, but we decided we should change our name because one day we received a letter from La Warnet, I tell you, saying that, well, maybe your name is very similar to a name of one of our TV series. So please change it. It was shocking. Uh, in fact, the, the day that we received this letter, we were super happy because La Warner, Warner Bros knows that we already exist. So it was super cool. But you know, we don't want to get in trouble with Warner Bros. So we decided to change our name to Big Van Science. And this is the name that we, we already have. Um, the people that started this group, well, we started this group without a business plan, without anything. The only thing that we wanted to do was to communicate science through theater using mainly stand-up comedy because uh, it was a very powerful format. In fact, uh, our most successful format um, during all these years, during these eight years of trajectory, it has been the stand-up comedy shows talking about science. And who started this group, this big van? People that now is quite famous. So we started this group, um, mainly five people. One of them is was Eduardo Sainz de Cabezón, that um, nowadays is the presenter of Orbital Aika. And also he's uh, very famous in YouTube with a math channel, a math channel talking about maths with one million and a half followers talking about math. So yes, science is something that people want to hear about, want to know more about. The thing is that we need to change the format we communicate science to be more engaging. Um, so in Big Bang Science is Eduardo, is Javier Santaolalla, maybe sounds familiar also. He's a very famous YouTuber now. And all of us started with this, with this ambition of communicate science in an innovative ways. So yeah, Big Bang Science did its big, big bang. So eight years ago, uh, we started to do performances all over Spain. Uh, we started to be also well known in Latin America. So we have been also performing in Latin America in many occasions, which is also great. And what we notice is that people want to know more about science. Science is something relevant. Science is something very interesting to people, but people don't want, and I'm talking about audiences, different audiences, want to know more about science, but they want to have new ways of incorporating this science. Uh, they don't want to read textbooks or boring articles, you know, they, they, they want these innovative ways, drawing, performing, this kind of innovative approaches to science. So when we started with this big fan science without a business plan or without anything, because the only thing that we wanted to do was to perform. So we started to perform, yes, all over Spain and things like that. And I remember the first Congress that I presented the project, Big Van Science. It was a Congress of Science Communicators at UB, uh, the University of Barcelona. I went there, I was so enthusiastic about the project. You know, it's, it's the first time I'm going to present something in a, in a Congress for science communicators, and I'm going to present my own project that is Big Fan Science. So I went there, I present the project, stand-up comedy, theater, clown. <laughs> and the first feedback that I had was of one of these uh, old science communication at UB. I'm not going to say his name, even if I remember perfectly, but I'm going to say it. And he told me, the only thing you are going to get doing theater and stand-up comedy is maybe free beers in the bars. You know, you can go to a pub, do stand-up comedy, and you will get free beers, but nothing else. And it was so heartful for me <laughs> that I said, I'm going to do it. It's the, it's the only thing. So I'm going to go a tope with this thing. And yeah, we decided to create a company and to, and to apply for some grants. And in fact, the second year that we were running this Big Bang Science, we got two European projects. 
he has to engage uh, with high school students through performing arts. And I want to show you something. If I can share my, my screen, let me check. Mm -mm, just to just to tell you, let me see if I can share. Ooh, it's going to be, let's see. Your entire screen, yes, this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, guys, can I hope you can see my screen? I'm going to check it. Do, 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 yes. So, this is Big Bang Science, and this is something incredible that we did. That is that during these European projects, and as long as we are scientists, we have our peer review articles. Yes, to say that drama-based activities, so performing activities for STEM education is really valuable uh, activities. So we started also to publish our own research in this peer review, um, in this uh, peer review way. So yes, uh, what is the conclusion here? That even if someone tells you that is stupid what you are going to do or that you are not going to be able to reach anything, go ahead for this. Uh, the thing that I did was join my two passions. That was theater and, um, and science, of course. And what I, what I got there was an incredible project, super innovative, that love of people that lot of people love. Um, this is what normally say it, normally people say is the pathway for for succeed. So you start with your self discovery, my passions. You know, um, I'm very passionate about theater and very passionate about science, and you go to market. Um, so 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 this is the pathway that you can follow to be successful. What I can tell you is the pathway to be successful is this one here. So it's going to be a roller coaster, like a montaña rusa. So ups and downs every day. Uh, people telling you you are not going to get anything. Um, trying to fight against um, everyone that say you are not going to get it. Uh, but guys, <laughs> at the end, uh, if you find your passion, try to join this with science, because maybe you are going to find an innovative way to communicate science. And now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, in my case, uh, let me put my face again here. So, ta-da, my face again, super. So, so I'm thinking about, I don't know, maybe you are passionate about dancing or about drawing or about singing or about whatever. Try to join this with science. And I would say um, maybe, maybe you are going to find a new way to engage people with science. And yeah, why not? Maybe you are creating your own company and your own business based, based on that. So, um, yeah, um, I would like, I don't know if I have more time, maybe I would like to present on some of the projects that we are developing and we are very proud of that. Uh, just very briefly, one of the projects, uh, it's a new European project and it's called uh, Valuart, in which we are training scientists to develop their own projects of science communication, but with a social impact. So how science communication can change societies and what, what is the social impact that we can have with, uh, with science communication. We are also working with um, Save the Children in a project in which we, in which we are developing uh, science activities, always working through arts and artistic disciplines, for example, in this case, we use not only theater, but also dancing and also rap, like rapping, um, with uh, these, uh, these uh, kids that come comes to Spain without company, so menores no acompañados. And we are trying to develop with them also this kind of science activities because science is super relevant for, for everyone. 
And of course, we we are also performing inside the regular programs of uh, different theaters. We work together with different uh, pharmaceutical companies also to develop different projects, educational projects for, for high schools and for primary schools. And we are very active also on YouTube and uh, television. So you can see people from Big One Science in TV programs like Orbita Laika or Aprendemos en Clan. Uh, so we are very proud about what we what we got with this big van science company and if you can if you can please follow us in our in our networks our right here uh, it's big van science and you can see everything that we do uh, if you also type scientifics you can see a very cool project for kids um, that is related to science communication, but using clowning approaches. And that's it. I would love to listen to your questions because um, I know ah, we have some questions here here in the chat. So ha, how is being female in a male dominated field? Both science, arts, humor. Do you think it has been more difficult for you to get where you are now? Love this question because yes, in Big One Science, I said we are 30 people, more or less. I think we are 32, 33, don't really know. But yeah, 30 collaborators and we are only five female performers because it's really difficult. It's not difficult at all to find women in science. Uh, it's difficult to find women in physics, in engineering, in maths, but it's not difficult to find women in science. You know, biomedical science have a lot of women there, of women. Uh, the problem is that we are, we are not so confident stepping into a stage. And of course, as we don't have role models to follow, there is, it's very difficult to find women that are related to humor. So comedians and all these kind of profiles are very difficult to find. And yes, only five of us in Big One Science are uh, female performan performers. And it has been more difficult to me well, I'm now, yeah, it, it has been, I think it has been more difficult to go into a stage and to be funny because what I found is normally uh, different types of audiences don't like or don't think that women can be funny. Uh, because most of the comedians, uh, monologists here in Spain are, are male. So, yeah, for me, it's like when I step into the stage, I find that people is like more reluctant to, to laugh when they see a, a woman. Um, difficult, difficult how to deal with that. But love this question. Thank you very much, Rocio. So um, if I understood correctly, your performances are main, and mainly in person. Yes. In light of the COVID situation, do you also have an online presence or stream performances? Yes, Madeleine, yes, of course. During this year, it has been terrible. You know, in March, we saw all our calendar falling down because all the activities and things that we had already um, in our calendar just were canceled and we went online. So we are now performing online and we are now very active on YouTube and um, yeah, doing mainly videos. Many, many people want videos, for example, in Congresses, we used to perform in Congresses, let's say Quantum Physics Congress, and I want a final performance. Can you do something? Yes, we can do something. We can write a script and performance in the Congress. As long as all these events uh, has gone online, so we also have gone online and uh, yeah, we performance online and we do many different projects now that are online. All the trainings that we do, because we train a lot of uh, researchers for science communication skills and oral skills. So yes, all our trainings are now online. <laughs> let's, let's see for the next months 
we will love face-to-face -face events so we will, we will love to have again these face-to-face -face events so um more more things um it is very challenging to adapt your jokes to different audiences is it very challenging telling jokes to people from different countries i guess it's also hard yes and no and i would say it's amazing how universal can be some jokes uh, related to science and uh, how scientists are and it's amazing and we have been in fact i find more differences between different parts of spain than when you go to latin america uh, people in, in Latin America is amazing and they get the humor like this. So I remember the first time we went to Latin America, we, went, we were so scared about our, you know, the, the thing that we were going to do because is it going to work? The jokes are going to be fine with them. And yes, no problem with that. Maybe, of course, if you have references to something that is uh, cultural, for example, I don't know, um, uh, in the origin of the universe, we have there Jordi Hurtado. Uh, of course, Jordi Hurtado is someone that people from Spain knows, but not people from other countries. But it's amazing. There is always, always one person that can be uh, that can be um, uh, well that has the same profile as Jordi Hurtado. So you have to ask for these cultural references. But general jokes work very, very well. Um, yes. So uh, again, thank you, thank you so much for all your questions, and I think we can continue with the rest. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, your talk was really, really inspiring. It really inspired me to see how you have joined both uh, of your patients, uh, science and communication, a theater performing. Uh, it's really nice. Congratulations. And of course, well, a uh, couple of questions. Um, first, because you said that you apply for European funding and so on, is this funding uh, for uh, the projects that you are developing and it also covers for salaries for higher people and so on? Yeah, yeah, they are European projects that cover everything. So, oh, so this is the good, yeah, this is the good part. So, European Commission has uh, projects related with science and society. So, what what uh, it was called until this year, now they are going to change, but um, they were called SWAFs. So, science with and for society, and you can apply there for different grants and different projects that also cover your salaries. So. I have to be very proud to say that now I'm full time with Big Bang Science, and yes, all my all my uh, payments comes from Big Bang Science, and yes, all our salaries are are there. That's amazing, uh, especially as well when you have uh, got people who told you where you were gonna get these uh, beers, as you say. And well, this shows that uh, we do not have to listen to that people who are telling us what we can or cannot do. So really, thank you for inspiring us uh, with that. And I was also wondering, uh, do you also take up volunteers who maybe want to, you know, participate in short uh, projects that you're doing in a voluntary way? Or Yes, uh, we are not very fan of volunteering in this kind of activities, especially if our projects are paid. We are also looking for people, Amazing. but we try. We all we always try to pay the people for the for the work that they are doing. So we are not very fan of volunteering, but of course we do activities that are volunteering. For example, we are working in this project with uh, Save the Children. Is uh, we totally we 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 don't earn money. We earn many other things, but not money. So yes, we volunteer in the projects that we want to volunteer, but we don't ask for people to work yeah. with us uh, without being paid. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I was mainly wondering because uh, some researchers who might want uh, to participate in projects over contracts, uh, they don't let us have other type of contracts so in that case uh, if you want to do let's mm -hmm. say both things uh, you cannot get paid uh, from uh, the second 
of, let's say, that's why I was wondering as well about yes. volunteering. You are, you are right, and we are dealing with that because we know that some PhD students have these grants that you cannot have a yeah. second payment. But um, exactly. you can, yeah, you, at the end you can pay, yeah. you can have a second contract, but you can you can pay in terms of rendimientos de trabajo, something like that. So so at the end you can you can get paid somehow. Yeah, it is amazing that uh, you're you're doing that, and I will try to cover uh, with salaries and so on. That's that's amazing. Uh, also, all the projects that you've talked about, uh, save the children, is as well uh, very inspiring. And I uh, really thank you very much for being here today. It's, it's been thank a you. pleasure hearing you. And I hope uh, in the future we can count with you for something else. Oh, thank you sure. very much. A pleasure. And, uh, thank you. <laughs> our pleasure. Thank you so much. So, well, uh, with this, I will introduce uh, the next speaker. It's uh, Fernando Gomoyon Bell. As I told you at the beginning, uh, Fernando was, is one of the reasons that we are doing this today. Uh, Fernando has a PhD in organic chemistry and uh, he has worked as an intern science writer for Chemistry World from the Royal Society. And between 2016 and 2018, he was a science communicator at the ICIC, the Institute of Catalan Research in Tarragona. And now Fernando is the Press and Communications Coordinator for the Grafem flagship, which is one of the biggest European Union funded projects with a batch of uh, 1 billion euros. He also freelances for Chemistry World, UPAC, and many others. So Fernando, the, the screen is, is yours. Uh, go and, and inspire us uh, with, with your path and with your communication science. Thank you very much. Hello, Isabel. Thank you so much for, for the kind introduction. Um, I hope you guys can see me. I have a little bit more, uh, more traditional presentation <laughs> than uh, Elena, um, a bit more classic in that. So I'm going to try to share the PowerPoint uh, presentation now if this works. So I hope you will be seeing my presentation now. Um, again, this is going to be about uh, science communication and particularly science writing which is also a valid option uh, to do with your science career. And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about my path and a little bit um, about the different options you may have and how this uh, actually works. OK, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, everybody at ICMO for like inviting me here, uh, especially Ruth, uh, Raquel, and, and Isabel for doing this. It's a really nice webinar. I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, Isabel has done a fantastic uh, job introducing me, so I'm just going to skip this uh, uh, slide because it just tells a little bit about what I do. Uh, my main job is at the Graphene flagship, it's a big European project, so I handle some of the communications uh, there. And then, like uh, she said, I also sometimes freelance for uh, some uh, magazines like Chemistry, CNN, uh, and I've done some work with uh, local TV and radio in uh, in Spain as well. So. You may find me in YouTube. Uh, I'm not as successful as uh, Javier or uh, Eduardo, people that Helena has just mentioned, but I think you can find some videos of me doing um, chemistry experiments around, around the net. Um, so I, I'm guessing that most of you are academic uh, researchers and basically the academic life is kind of always follows the same line from you know grad school to becoming a professor and eventually you hope to do your own research and have your own funding. Uh, but this doesn't have to be uh, this way. Um, a career in academia actually prepares you for many, many more other options. And uh, this webinar is kind of intended to show you some of these options and, and some of the options that are actually farther away from academia, uh, like performing, uh, cooking, or, or writing and, and creating um, communication content. But the skills that you acquire uh, during your PhD are very useful for many other career paths. So um, don't, don't think that you're only good to do science and you're only good to make that material that you make uh, during your PhD thesis. You're actually prepared to do much more. Uh, plus, when you have your PhD or even like your bachelor or master's in science, you learn how to be really uh, resilient and hardworking and solve problems. And that's something that is really, really uh, sought by like employers uh, outside of academia. So uh, consider other options um, and actually consider that what the speakers today uh, 
are doing, it's actually not the alternative. Um, it's actually the mainstream. So the alternative is staying in academia. So this um, article by uh, Natalie Lafranco in, in Chemical and Engineering News shows that from the group of younger chemists in, in the American Chemical Society, only 17% of them are working in academia. The rest are working in industry, are working in non-traditional careers. Um, but again, they're not non-traditional, like getting out of, of academia and the academic system is the, the mainstream uh, decision. But now I wanted to talk about what I do and how I do it. So I wanted to introduce you to science communication um, and science writing. Uh, and it's basically the opposite of what this comic strip um, is trying to say. Um, it much seems like when you read an academic paper, uh, it is written in a form that is almost like a weird language that nobody is supposed to understand. It's very hard to follow. Uh, and sometimes even reading the abstract or the conclusions, you don't have a clear idea of what the paper is about. So uh, science communication, science writing is actually about the opposite. It's actually about finding a way to tell what's uh, going on in the paper um, in a manner that is exciting and uh, interesting for the general audience and the general public to, to read. Uh, also, all these things that we're talking about, um, you know, performing, writing, um, doing art uh, and scientific art, this will help maximize your impact. Uh, if your papers get covered by the general media, they're going to get more citations and they're going to get more visibility, uh, which eventually is something that I guess uh, you as scientists uh, care about. So even if you don't want to write about your papers yourself or if you don't want to go and perform in a theater yourself, try to contact people that do communication because this can really help you uh, get more coverage and get your paper to the, the mainstream uh, media. And that's really important for the visibility of your research, for the visibility of your paper, and also for the visibility of, of yourself as, as a scientist, which eventually is good for funding and, and finding new collaborators and finding collaborations with industry. So think about this when uh, the next time you publish uh, a paper. Um, and sometimes even a simple action like tweeting and, and having like a campaign on Twitter can increase uh, downloads and citations. This is not always necessarily good because I mean, sometimes if a paper is tweeted a lot, it doesn't mean it's a good paper. We've got a very recent example this week with a Nature Comes article that was quite controversial talking about um, female role models. Um, and it was a very, very badly uh, designed and methodically <laughs> flawed paper, but it created a lot of discussion. So it's gonna probably get a lot of downloads and a lot of citations, but that doesn't mean it's a good paper. But anyhow, Twitter is a great way to also get more engagement, get more people excited about your research. Um, so use social media as well to connect with your, your colleagues and it can increase your, your impact. But again, I wanted to talk about uh, what I do and about science writing. And even if you don't believe me, uh, every paper um, that you can find actually tells a story. Um, it may be hidden, it may be really complicated to find, but uh, eventually um, every paper is telling a story and finding that story and telling that to the public is uh, is a really interesting exercise and it's a really cool thing to do. So for example, uh, you need to find a narrative, you need to find a way to tell that, uh, that story. You tr should write a story that is never patronizing. You shouldn't assume that your audience uh, knows things that you do know. Uh, you shouldn't you know, be super obvious about like some statements because people are not supposed to know everything you, you're talking about. You have to write stories that are convincing uh, to show people what is the novelty of the things that you're writing about. And then most of the times uh, this strikes like a very weird thing to, to most scientists, but you may need to avoid facts and numbers. And this is because the research suggests that, because that's very confusing to, to the people reading. Uh, you need to be very clear about the conclusions without giving any numbers or any percentages or something like that, because that um, is actually doing the opposite effect. And when you talk about a vaccine being 70% effective 
or when you talk about homeopathy not working because you know it wasn't carried like in a double blind study all those terminologies and numbers are really confusing the public so when you tell a story you really need to find a way to do it in a in a in a manner that it's not giving a lot of information that is literally you know making everybody a little bit confused so this is a kind of bit of like a sneak peek of my process so um, this is literally an article that i wrote about like a couple of weeks ago so uh, what i do when i get the pdf of the of the article basically read it uh try to extract the most important information and then those are like all the stages that i go through to get to the final manuscript you see there's a lot of versions uh there's some audio files because there's interviews with the authors and then interviews with independent experts um there's also images there's press releases so there's a lot of information that gets gathered into like the story and getting the full um idea of what's going on and what's what's happening in that article mainly because i'm a science writer and a science communicator i'm not an expert in all of these uh, fields so i need to talk to different people i need to have an idea of what's going on uh, and then something that is really important at this um, stage uh, is that you consider that you know sometimes when you get the paper accepted that is when you need to talk to the journalists the communicators your communications office or you know are the science writers because then um otherwise people are not going to consider your paper news so in this case i got this paper which is a nature paper i got it like three weeks before it was published i know this sounds a bit weird for people doing science but yeah some journalists and science writers would get this option so i got the paper soon i got to read it like calmly and then you get time to actually work on the article which is really 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 cool so contact if you want to publicize your paper contact the science writers and the communicators, like the earlier, the better. Uh, like I said, the process is quite um, complicated. You need to like read a lot, not only the paper, but often you need to read other papers in the same field to understand what's the state of the art, uh, why that paper that you're writing about is a breakthrough. Uh, you normally need to interview a lot of people um, to kind of get a better idea of, of why the paper is important to the field. Um, sometimes you interview people for like half an hour or you get like a page of like responses in an email uh, and then you just end up using one sentence but the rest is also important because it gives you a lot of information uh, and then eventually you have to write it which is also a lot of work and then gets a lot of uh, edits from your like editors in the magazine so it's it's kind of an interesting process you saw how many stages that had in the previous slide um but again the result is very very nice and the result is very um you know attractive to the reader um this again is the same nature paper that i was showing you before um working together with the researchers allowed us to have a very nice uh, article it also allowed us to have a very nice picture i mean i don't know if you uh, like this picture as much as i do but it's actually amazing that's a super tiny electrode but thanks to photography you can see it like super close up and you can see how bubbles form in the electrode and how hydrogen is being generated quicker. Um, and that this is really, I mean, it, it's really amazing. And the paper, uh, sorry, the story on this paper is actually now one of the most read uh, in the magazine this week. So I think it was a very, very challenging thing to do. And it's it's a very interesting process and it can be literally done with um, any paper. Uh, this paper, if you look at the abstract and the graphical abstract and all those uh, information it looks very very technical however it, it's very interesting technique and it became like a really cool story as well um you know with like when you have the image and when you have all the you know nice headline and nice text um that's a way to attract the public and it's it's very interesting a very rewarding process to go from the paper to a story that people will enjoy reading um and I have been showing you uh, stories on like Chemistry World or other magazines that are that are uh, quite specialized. But one part of my job is also to make the general public and the general and mainstream media interested about these papers. And uh, this is an example from my previous job at ICIQ in Tarragona, 
we had this ACS catalysis paper that, I mean, if you read the title and you read the abstract, you probably have no idea what the paper is about, but they were doing a very cool thing. They were doing sustainable plastic with uh, CO2 and renewable sources and uh, renewable products. So it got covered in the, in the newspapers. Here, the headline is not ours, sadly, probably not the best headline ever, because it basically means uh, orange plastic. But um, it, it was a very nice um, example of how you can translate almost any paper, specialized paper, to a press release that actually gets to the media. Um, and another, um, another example that I really, really like is this one from uh, some colleagues uh, in Switzerland. They sent me this paper where they had actually put together one of the first uh, artificial leaves. So it was a device that all in one was capable of getting sunlight and CO2 on water and making chemical fuels out of it. Um, like a leaf uh, actually makes uh, glucose and fuels for the plant. So um, I managed to like place this paper uh, onto the Times, which you know is probably the most prestigious uh, newspaper in the, in the UK and one of the most prestigious in Europe. So you can always find nice stories in a paper and you can always try to convince um, uh, journalists and science writers to write about them. And, and this is a really, really cool process and it involves a lot of uh, creativity, but also it really, really involves a lot of uh, the scientific knowledge that you have gathered during your PhD and your studies because um, all that is needed to uh, really know what the paper is about, understand the science, and actually translate that to the journalists or to the people writing about the writing about that discovery. Again, there's many many ways to do this. Uh, you can do, uh, you know, you can do performing uh, like we've seen before. You can do science writing. Uh, we have a talk coming up on scientific illustration and comics. There's many many ways uh, to share your science. Um, Again, you may not be good at all of them, but I'm sure you can find a way to, to reach to the public. And then I also like to think that, you know, you're always trying to, uh, to do this uh, dissemination and this outreach. So even when you're meeting your family, um, you, you have to talk about what you do in the lab and you have to do that in an approachable way, trying to find a story, trying to find a goal uh, of why you're doing your research. And, and I really think that you know, this is a complicated project, but learning how to do this and le learning how to communicate your science is actually very useful for, for every scientist uh, because you're going to get not only higher impact, but also you're going to get, you know, a, a prestige in the community because you know how to explain things and you may eventually get more famous, more funding. And I think it's a great uh, thing to do. And again, we've got theater, we've got illustration. There's also people that do poetry. <laughs> Um, you know, this guy uh, did a poem about a molecule for each letter in the alphabet. This is quite cool. Um, there's even papers that are uh, written in poem. It's another way to reach a different public. I think this was a very nice um, example like, that I could show uh, because none of us were talking about poetry. Um, you know, even new ways of communication such as um, emojis can become uh, a way of of communicating science. This is a tweet by chemist uh, Nicola Gaston, and it's an amazing periodic table made out of emojis. I know it's complicated to interact right now uh, with like me being the presenter and you being the audience, but I dare you to find some elements. I don't know if you guys are chemists, but I mean, it's super interesting to find that, you know, of the stars because that hydrogen, helium is a little balloon. I love francium here. <laughs> which is a little croissant. I mean, this periodic table is just freaking amazing. Uh, and I really love how like a single emoji, like a single icon can be used to, to give you uh, scientific knowledge or like um, scientific fact. I think it's, it's really cool. Uh, and there's many, many ways to do this. Uh, and I, I actually dare you to like find ways to, to communicate your science in a way that is um, engaging and that is um, interesting. I don't know. I think that's, this particular graph is like really, really cool. Uh, and again, we're gonna have a whole talk about art and illustration after this. And I'm sure that um, Miriam's gonna be a way better speaker than I am uh, talking about why art and comic books are important. But I just wanted to show you like, you know, sometimes uh, partnering up with people that know about um, art and illustration, it's a great way to engage the audience and it's a great way to get 
um, people attracted in a different way. A text sometimes is a little bit boring. People don't want to read that, but if you've got like a nice illustration, a nice way to tell the story, um, this really helps. This is a magazine that I sometimes collaborate with in, in Spain, which basically does that. It does combines narrative and science stories with like very good illustration. And this particular story here, uh, it's a story about antibodies. Uh, even you, though you probably wouldn't even say by seeing that. But it's a story about antibodies and how antibodies became uh, one of the first treatments for uh, Crohn's disease and other inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, and it's a story that is, is quite nice, but if you see like the illustration and the magazine it comes in, it's actually a very nice way to catch your attention and, and get you interested in, in the story. If you want to get the, the magazine, you can get it online. Um, and I think it's a very, very nice magazine and there's a lot of uh, things to explore. I haven't read this one uh, except for my article because it just came out like a week ago and it hasn't reached the UK. But again, I, I encourage you to go and get it because um, it's, it's a very nice uh, way of, of telling science. And again, even, even in the lab, you can do art uh, and make your science more visible. These are a few examples of covers uh, of like uh, different scientific journals. And all these covers, I believe, are from um, IC mole uh, research papers. So um, all these have been published by researchers at IC mole. And, you know, having the cover attracts the attention of even the scientists that are reading the paper. And for me as a science writer, if I go to one of these journals to get ideas for stories, and I see a very cool cover. Um, I'm going to probably click on that and read about it and see what the article is about. So it's a really nice way if you get the opportunity to do a, a cover for a journal, um, try to contact an illustrator, try to contact someone who really knows how to do this. And because it, it really is a great opportunity to uh, to be featured in, in a nice way and to grab uh, grab the attention of, of people. And again, like I have said, I'm not going to like take a lot longer. This really, really works. Like, I mean, research becomes more known to others if you if you talk about it in the newspapers, if you talk about it in the covers, if you talk about it, uh, you know, through theater or illustration. Um, it not only leads to an increase in citations, but it also leads to an increase in collaborations with external companies and other groups. Um, and again, it improves uh, kind of your uh, profile. So in that way, um, when, you know, funding applications are being reviewed or people are considering whether they're going to give funding to a particular group or to another group. Uh, if they know your name from the papers, you're more likely to get that funding. So I think it's a, it's a very nice way to, to get more impact and it's a really nice way to um, make a change and tell the public uh, what you do and what you'd like to do. Uh, like I said before, you need to find um, the way that you like the most or not necessarily if you don't like to communicate, if you don't like to write about your science, maybe just find people that will do that for you. But again, it's a very interesting field. Only a few of you are gonna stay in academia. So if you find other careers beyond that, just go uh, explore, try to get out a little bit of, of the world that is the lab and the academic system and see there's so many different options. I mean, just today, the four options that we're seeing are so, so amazing. Um, I mean, I'm amazed by <laughs> performing an illustration and I mean, cooking even. I, I didn't know that you could be a scientist and become a professional. Uh, cook. That's really amazing. Um, so go out, do different things and try different things. Um, and because this uh, uh, seminar is also about learning, um, I'm leaving here uh, some resources that are um, completely free. So you can take a video course on YouTube, uh, you can take a writing course on, like, uh, online, um, you can learn how to talk to the media if you get a call by a journalist in some of these uh, courses. I think um, these are very interesting resources for all of you. Um, and I'm gonna send the presentation to the organizers so they can share them with, with you or you can uh, screenshot this and get the links um, or you can email me and I can send you the information. I mean, these are very nice resources. And also if you like to write or if you write papers often, another resource that is very useful is this um, website called Hemingway App um, because it tells you if you're writing very long sentences, if you're using uh, passive, um, you know, which is probably better used as an active voice, if you're using verbs that make no sense or that could be simplified, 
if you're using too many adverbs, uh, if you you know taking too long to say something. Uh, if you go to this app, uh, it's amazing to draft your paper, your introduction of your paper, your abstracts, uh, because it really gives you a, a nice view of what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Um, and it's a great tool to see if you're doing, um, if you have a very clear and, and interesting writing. There's other tools as well, such as Grammarly, that uh, do a very similar thing. Um, and again, uh, I don't want to take any more of your time because I really want to hear uh, the next speakers. If you have any questions or any ideas, um, you feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, that's my, my email address, my Twitter profile. Um, just you know, tweet me or send me an email and be super happy to, to answer your questions. I'm happy to answer the questions that we have now. I don't know how to see those, but yeah, um, I'll try to go back to the platform and, and answer your questions. So thank you so much for your kind attention and uh, looking forward to answering that. Okay. Mm. So we've got questions from uh, Laura or Laura. I'm a PhD student, I'm a friend, I, I, really, I don't really read many papers. Could you tell me a proper average per week? Uh, in what stage of your PhD you submitted your first article? I don't know if this really applies to communication uh, and I don't know how many papers you should read per week. <laughs> uh, but um, I think I submitted my first, uh, if you mean like my first paper as a PhD, I think it was like probably my second year of the of PhD, I don't know. Um, and about reading whatever feels comfortable. I, I try to do like a weekly or bi-weekly revision of what has been published in my field, but again, it all depends on what you work on and what you're interested in. Uh, then there's people asking uh, if there's essential to have a master's in science communication um, to explore the field. Um, I'm gonna say no, because there's many places that you can work in without that master's and I think that you know, probably Elena would say the same. Uh, it's it's not uh, something that is needed. Uh, but again, if you want to become a professional, it's something that really helps. Uh, so there's many places, uh, not only in Spain, but also in Europe that have wonderful programs. Uh, and it's great to learn more about different fields. Um, and also it's a really nice way to get uh, all the, like new connections with people that work uh, in newspapers, in radio, in TV. So um, it helps but it's definitely not needed. Uh, and I know that for a fact, I mean, I got my job at ICIQ without a master's in, in science communication. Um, and then I've got Elena saying, thank you, Fernando. How did you approach such a big newspapers of magazines with your story published? Uh, could you give us some hints? So this process, um, I think the slang of, of journalism is called uh, sending a pitch. Um, so it's basically sending an idea to an editor and, and trying to convince them that your idea is good and that they should write about it or that they should ask you to write about it. Um, the process is sometimes easier than you may think. You uh, just need to find that editor's email or sometimes even Twitter handle and, and try to DM them if they have the, the direct messages open. And you just go and say, hey, I have found this paper. I think it's relevant because of this, this, and this. And I think it suits your newspaper or your publication because of this, this, and that. Um, again, there's no perfect recipe. This is like submitting a paper to a journal. You get rejected a lot. And sometimes you get good news. Uh, I have shown you the successes, but I could show you at least 10 uh, failures for each success. So you never know. There's no tricks. Um, I must say that, you know, it also helps the, you know, when you used to have like conferences and science journalism conferences, if you know the people, uh, you know what kind of topics they like more, so you can direct your pitch to the to the best publication. Um, and I really don't understand the question by um, uh, Sophia. It says, you get project offers directly. Do you choose the journal? I really don't know what uh, you mean by that. Uh, but um, I can, I don't know if I can give you the mic or you can just um, send me like a question on email and I can, can try to reply to that, sorry about that. And I'm, I'm giving the floor back to, oh, okay, good. Um, 
yeah, it depends. So sometimes I, so Sophia said, I, if researchers contact me directly, I, I'm guessing with papers or stories, right? So it depends. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they know me already from Twitter or from previous collaborations and they send me their paper and say, hey, I think this is interesting. Can you try writing about it? Uh, that was the case of the nature paper that I showed you. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's just me going through like web pages or you know, my work email and finding interesting uh, papers that I think should be reported on. And in that case, um, I, I just go along and, and conduct the publication. And then I contact the authors to, to set up an interview and talk about the paper. I hope that answers your question. If, uh, if not, you can always, um, yeah, send me, send me an email and I can give you more, more answers. I want to get the floor back to, to Isabel uh, so uh, we can go to the next speaker. I think we're slightly late and I, I don't want to be blamed for that. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Fernando. It was a very interesting talk uh, with lots of information that I think is going to be very useful for all of us. And uh, well, yeah, I want well, I wanted to ask you a very small question. But I don't know if uh, you are still there, or otherwise I'll leave it for later. That, that's fine. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, so so my question was related to the fact that uh, what you you showed at the beginning about uh, people saying that these careers, let's say, are non-traditional careers. Uh, I've been hearing about this a lot, and uh, I've got actually some friends that left academia that uh, told me that somehow they felt uh, like they left because, uh, you know, like, like they weren't good enough or something like that. Uh, and that's like, uh, let's say, um, a feeling that some some people like put, put on us, like academia is a career path to follow. Have you ever got as well comments like that from other yeah, people, you, like Elena? You you're not gonna get uh, anything from these or sort of things like that. Yeah, you get a lot of comments like that, especially at the very beginning. Um, I, I mean, I I started doing both my. I think you cannot see me. I can I can switch the camera on. No, um, no. Sorry. I started doing the uh, like m some of the communication in parallel to the PhD. So you know, you get a lot of comments saying you know it's complicated to handle both. You need to tell the difference. Yeah. And and unless you go full time, uh, you never get the you know the people recognizing that you're doing a full time job on that. Uh, but then it's a it's a valid career path. Uh, you still. Uh, I mean, you're in touch with the science as well. Um, and I normally, I think I'm including those slides at every presentation that I give. I don't know if it's to like convince myself that, that you know, I'm not an imposter and I'm actually still a scientist or something like that. Um, oh, or it's to like, show people, but it's, it's really confusing that people consider that supporting academia or getting out is like a failure. Um, but again, it's actually not. I mean, it's, it's not a failure. No, it's not. Uh, yeah. The same is not a failure to like, I don't know, study law, you can become a judge, you can become a lawyer, you can become a notary, there's many options. So it's the same if you become a chemist, you have so many options to choose from. So uh, I don't think any of them are, are a failure. And, and again, one good thing about any of these things that we keep not thinking about because we have like a very specific mindset is that normally you can go back. So if you want to go back to academia, you can do research in science communication, uh, you can mm, go back to research if you want. Uh, I know people that have done that, uh, and it's it's possible. Yeah. Uh, and then again, you can go to a completely different field, and it's still okay. Like I, I don't see that as a failure. No, me neither. Thank you, thank you very much. And this question was also to reinforce the fact that uh, leaving academia is not a failure. And if there's people telling you that it is, or that you're not going to achieve anything uh, from it. Well, that's their point of view. It doesn't have to be ours, and it doesn't represent reality. So, well, thank you very much for your talk again. Uh, now I'm going to introduce Miriam, the our next speaker. Uh, so Miriam uh, did a bachelor's degree in human biology and then a master in scientific, medical, and environmental communication. She communicates science in comic format. Uh, she's the founder of Biomics, which is biology in comics, a project that helps entities of the scientific area to communicate 
the research with a visual, a catching and understandable rigorous format. She has worked uh, for, with many companies and uh, foundings like uh, Rocher, the King's College uh, of London, the Spanish Cancer Association, and also with the Institute of Molecular Science, among many others. She is the technical secretary and the head of uh, communication for the Catalan Association of Scientific Communication. Please, uh, Miriam, uh, join us and inspire us with your career path. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you, Isabel, for introducing me. Um, well, uh, you have introduced me very well, so I just can say I can start from here. And well, since we are here to know more about other careers beyond the academia, I think the best mm, way to start is explaining you what my job consists in as a scientific comic drawer. So I will start with an example of an ICMOL comic because we are here in this webinar organized by them and I'm very very glad for being here. Uh, thank you also for being here today. And well, uh, the, first, the first thing you must know is that although Kamai is a scientific comic drawer, uh, drawing is the part in which I spend less time uh, in my working process, no more but less. How is that possible? Because, well, in this context, comics are a scientific communication tool. So, um, there are um, lots of tasks to do before start drawing. The first thing we, we, must, we must do is the briefing. I mean, this is a communication tool, so uh, what do you want to explain? Um, who? For who? Uh, how you will distribute this information? Uh, why are you explaining this? And I want to say that because when the researcher uh, which I, uh, who asked for this comic asked me for it, um, he didn't know <laughs> what uh, talking about. Uh, so we had to explore some options, perhaps uh, I see more research lines or disseminate about scientific concepts like, I don't know, um, organic or inorganic chemistry. Um, well, finally we decided we were talking about um, the IC more research lines and well for popu uh, for general population and we would distribute it um, in a printed way uh, and also online. Uh, once we we have this clear, uh, there's the part in which I spend more time, which is the documentation phase. Um, Sometimes uh, customers ask me for comics because they like my style or my drawings, but the fact is that the, the true value of scientific drawers are their background as scientists scientist, uh, and their ability to communicate, not only the, the drawing part. Uh, I had to read a lot. <laughs> uh, about, about this issue, uh, several papers, uh, journalistic articles, uh, for example, these ones about the MOF or quantum computation, etc. And that's very important because uh, scientific communicators, also also we are drawing, um, it's very important to keep the scientific rigor. I mean, um, we can't afford misinformate the, the population, okay? And that's also important because um, we need to have a global vision about the issue. When you have this global vision, it's when you can select the key messages because you can read a lot, but Finally, you will also explain, uh, you will only explain uh, two or three key messages. Uh, it's, it's preferable to communicate these two or three things than lots of things and make, and make people get lost, okay? 
So uh, then we can start with the creative part, which is not drawing, <laughs> which is uh, transform these key messages into a little story, a synopsis, in which we can uh, find some characters interacting between them and with a story in which can explain these key messages. And this is a resume, but then we have to write a script. This is an example of a script, okay? And here we can see that, well, all the details about what we are going to draw in every single vignette and the final text, I mean, all the dialogues. And here it's very important uh, to collaborate with the researcher, okay? This is not a work in which we work alone, but in collaboration with the researchers because they are the experts on this issue, okay? And here you can see, for example, all the comments of this researcher about my, about my script in order to improve it little by little. And when you have this, <laughs> we are not drawing. Uh, we, 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 keep on, we keep on this. Uh, well, after the script, we can start drawing, which is the part you perhaps you are interested in, but not the final comic, <laughs> okay? Uh, first, we have to draw um, in a more dirty way, okay? This is the sketch, the storyboard, where we can see the distribution of the vignettes, the structure of the comic, and, very important, the scientific the representation of our scientific elements for example the disposition of the atoms in these um, inorganic solids in this first vignette okay or perhaps the atoms in this other molecule um because of the rigor of the scientific rigor okay but well, when we have this clear, we can finally start with the final comic when you can use your colors and <laughs> all that we like so much. Um, this, for example, was the final comic for the IC Mall about its research lines. And well, it was about, um, uh, well, the main character is the butterfly molecule, which is this one here. And well, um, this molecule uh, has uh, rare properties, okay? On the contrary, uh, in organic solids, for example, this, ir the, this iron here has more um, established properties, okay? But um, thanks to the researchers in the IC mall, this butterfly molecule uh, can make shine the, uh, its rare properties thanks to uh, theoretical and experimental methodologies in there. And here, she also um, uh, meets other molecules with these rare properties, which in fact are very useful, for example, to create batteries or, or lots of objects we can use in our daily life, like pills, clothes, or plastics. Finally, our butterfly molecule uh, uh, is being used as temperature and pressure uh, sensor, and we explain that with a little final joke about the pressure Han Solo experiments in, in, one, in one scene of the fourth chapter of Star Wars. Uh, that's because uh, the comic uh, has the benefits of being a very funny, um, attractive and visual way to communicate science. And obviously, uh, as it is a communication tool, we have to make information arrive to people. And we can hear for uh, we can see here, for example, uh, this comic in a roll up or in sheets of paper that are distributed in open day in open days events or outreach events, conference, for example, in the European Researchers Night, which is this week. <laughs> and also um, in online platforms, for example, web or social media. So uh, now you know what um, a scientific comic drawer uh, job consists in. I think the next natural question is, okay, we, uh, we are here seeing um, untypical uh, scientific careers. How do you get, uh, how do you become a, a scientific comic drawer? 
Um, well, uh, as you can see here, um, I have a little chronology about my well, my, my well until today, and I have divided it in three parts because in every single part I learned something important that I want to share with, with you if you are exploring other careers beyond the academia. And well, we can start with my degree in human biology. Um, well, when you're about to finish um, high school, you have to decide what do you want to do with your life, right? Um, well, um, since I was a little, a little girl, I always liked very, very much drawing and also comics and manga. But finally, I decided to study biology because I was interested in it. But uh, there are other issues. For example, um, I was what we call a good student, okay? And adults uh, usually say that a scientific career is more profitable than an artistic one. So, well, I studied human biology um, and I entered uh, there um, thinking I, well, <laughs> I would become a researcher who, who who would fight against cancer and other illnesses, but well, um, in order to explore possibilities as a researcher, I did some internships, for example, in these two labs. Um, well, when my family and friends asked me if I if I was glad with my, with my internships, I usually, well, I used to, to say, um, of course, I'm very glad, I'm learning a lot, uh, well, it's super interesting, but today I confess that I didn't like it so much, okay? Um, at least not enough to becoming a researcher for the rest of my life. Um, I was worried because of that, because um, when you are in this type of career, uh, as Fernando said before, um, there's some kind of voice or echo in the air that says if you don't follow the researcher way, um, I mean, master, PhD, um, postdoc, um, PI, etc., and you have faith. And then I was worried about that because I was a student, okay? Um, but fortunately, I discovered a subject called scientific communication during my, my degree. And thanks to that, I could uh, think about, well, I could combine uh, drawing and science, explaining science with my drawings. And thanks to that, I started to contact, for example, with Ilustra Ciencia, a project about scientific illustration. I did my final degree project about this issue also. And I finally decided that I would do a master in scientific communication in order to communicate science, in this case, with my comics. And after this, this first stage, well, my, the lesson I want to share with you is that if you are exploring other careers beyond the academia, um, be calm because, um, well, keep calm because um, it's not a fail not doing a research career and be sincere with yourself because if I weren't, now I would be working in something I, well, I wouldn't be, um, well, pretending that I'm that I do, and it, this is not healthy. Well, um, second stage, master in scientific communication. Um, well, also um, again, in order to explore possibilities, I, since the beginning, I decided to do some internships. Uh, in, in the well, at the beginning, in Ilustra Ciencia, thanks to the contact I made. Uh, during my, my degree. And then in Galenia, a uh, medical communications office, and uh, I also started to, uh, to, well, to collaborate with Estenio, which is a platform uh, formed by scientific communicators and disseminators. And well, uh, during this this stage, I started to publish um, well comics like this one about different scientific or biological issues, 
uh, for example, doctor give me an antibiotic, and for my surprise, uh, it it had a huge impact, uh, at least for an account with 20 or 30 followers, and it receives uh, hundreds of retweets and likes, and it was also uh, published in some newspapers. So this was very important for me because it was a a push uh, to keep doing this type of comics. Uh, for example, about the DNA replication and, and mutations, about the about how vaccines work, or even uh, how bacteria exchange gen genes, uh, comparing these mechanisms with Pokemon. Uh, Publish this work uh, was very important also to start um, well, mm, to know other scientific drawers, okay? And I was very glad because uh, I admire them a lot uh, Well, I was a follower of them. And, and for example, uh, thanks to Estenio and thanks to one person who is Jesus Sanchez, thank you, Jesus, uh, I uh, get my first commission uh, as, well, a scientific comic, in this case, not drawer, but a scientific advisor, a, um, a scripter, and a storyboarder. I mean, all the faces uh, previous to the final comic because it was uh, for, a, for a communications agency and they had the, their own illustrator. But this was like a dream for me because uh, I could uh, discover again uh, that little girl who wanted to be mangaka, okay? Um, well, this is the this is uh, a sample of the comic, and nowadays you can access uh, for free to the to the materials in super in super v uh, Well, this is a comic about how vaccines work for children and teenagers. And what I learned in the second stage during my master. Um, um, first of all, um, publish your work because this is a very important step to start with the networking, okay? Uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, for, my, for my job, for my work, but uh, I think all of us are working hard, but also for the nice people I, I, could, I could meet. Um, so, if you want to enter in a sector, in a determined sector, uh, in a determined scientific field, uh, try to contact and try to be surrounded by nice people. Uh, help them and they will help you uh, collaborate together. And well, together you will arrive uh, far, far away. And well, my, my third stage, uh, which is my, well, my job actual situation um, with Biomics, because, well, okay, I finished my master. Uh, what I do now? Uh, looking for a job. Um, <laughs> I, I was looking for a job several, several months, uh, but, well, nobody wanted me. <laughs> no, uh, later, later they did. Um, well, uh, I started to to work in Super V during the master, but this project uh, takes several way, several months, and and there was one problem, and it was that if I wanted to continue working for them, I had to become freelance. Um, I mean, legally and fiscally and all of that. And I didn't want because uh, being freelance uh, is such a uh, fucking problem. <laughs> and well, uh, it's very hard at the beginning because you have to uh, learn about copyright, about how to do contracts, about how to do uh, fields, uh, when you put the button the fee and when not. And uh, this was very stressful, very stressful for me. But well, thanks to other commissions, I could start to being freelance uh, also for uh, Super Deep. And 
yeah, it's a project included in the ACCC, okay? So work hard, publish your work, and be surrounded by nice people, help them, and little by little, uh, you can uh, get these, these, type, these kind of things. And well, as you can see here, uh, nowadays I don't, I, I don't work for, for Aciertas and that's because also uh, thanks to some uh, formation in marketing, I, can, I could improve my own business, Biomix, Biology in Comics, and I, I could pass from uh, drawing during the weekends and nights to draw uh, part-time uh, in a more relaxed way, combining this with the ACC, in which I was freelance also, <laughs> always freelance. And well, uh, thanks to that, uh, nowadays I, could, I, I can work in such uh, beautiful projects like this one, also for the IC Mall, uh, which was a really difficult challenge for me because it was about spintronics. And well, it was very difficult, but we are very glad with the results. Uh, well, this is all the series, and, and nowadays uh, I I thank the IC more uh, a lot because they are uh, such nice people and well this is a Christmas I sent them last year because because of that because um, they were one of my first customers uh, as a scientific comic drawer and I'm very very glad to be here today in a webinar for them. And well, um, I I don't I don't just do the uh, comics for the IC ball, okay? I, I work with other people. For example, in this in this comic about uh, nanotherapies against cancer with the Spanish Association Against Cancer, or here uh, there's another one about um, personalized cardiology of the King's College London, and for example, this other one uh, for the Valde Brown Institute of Oncology about a new antibody against cancer. This one, for example, was published also in newspapers, and uh, this result was also uh, possible uh, in some way to uh, Galenia, uh, the second, the second, well, my second internship during the master, uh, which was a medical press office, and again, uh, publish your publish your work, uh, do things, uh, be surrounded by nice people, and little by little, uh, things will go on. And well, uh, what I can say about uh, about all well, after all these stages, um, then perhaps uh, now you are in a scientific career and you don't know what to do after that, but um, it's never too late to change, okay? Um, I know other people with scientific careers uh, that now are web developers, for example, and, and it's, not, uh, it's not bad to not follow the scientific typical way uh, but there are a lot of things to do as we can say in this in this webinar and well what I said um, be sincere with yourself uh, be surrounded with nice people show your work and well work hard that's uh, something we uh, all of us know and now you have seen my well my way until today uh, you can ask but okay is this the only way to become a scientific communicator or drawer? Of course not. Um, in fact, this is, uh, this is a way you must build yourself. And I have here three more examples. Uh, for example, Jesus Sanchez, who I mentioned before with his project, Laboratoons, which, which studied a biology degree. He, um, he has a PhD in immunology and molecular biology. He worked as a researcher. And nowadays, he is a scientific comic drawer about immunology and cancer. And he's also a scientific project manager in a cancer foundation. Okay. 
Uh, here we have also Juan Sanchez Verde Bilbao and Guido Rodriguez from Yo Doctor, who are doctors, and they are combining their job as doctors with comics. And in fact, they are they have published two comic books, and well, they are precious people. And, and lastly, we have here Ever Longas, which well, who who studied biochemistry and journalism. And at the beginning, he was infography, infographist in a newspaper, but then he mm, preferred to be infographist uh, for, for his own as a freelance. And so there are lots of ways. Uh, there's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can, I can give you a, a correct or a single answer, uh, but um people uh, can can help you if you are if well if you if you get lost and well finally um, i only can say that if you want me to be some of these beautiful people to be surrounded by uh, i will be very glad to to help you and and you my contact uh, which is well in social media medium r i i g and it would be a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Miriam, for such a nice talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. And it's also very nice uh, to see the person who is behind all those posters that I've been always amazed by and that I always stop at the corridors and, and look at them and read at them. It's also very nice and uh, I'll say a bit different to, to see that you were uh, that you're more, orient, more oriented towards this career since uh, an early stage, that you had it a little bit more clear. And I also really like the points of view that you all are, are sharing and are, are, are making clear that living in academia is not a failure. It could be indeed a victory because if you do not enjoy academia, why are you going to stay doing something that you do not enjoy? So, well, we've got a very interesting question that I was as well wondering myself. They said that what kind of skills uh, from ASIN, uh, what kind of skills are needed to enter in uh, science comics? Uh, if it's uh, photography, animation, painting, Photoshop. Uh, I was also wondering myself, I don't know if, if I didn't hear it, the, the type of software that you normally use. Okay. Um, well, um, first of all, uh, about about formation, um, the people I, the people I know, for example, these three people I, I mentioned, uh, are self-taught. Okay. Um, I mean, they they in my case also I learned to uh, use, for example, Inkscape, which is a, be a vector il illustration program open source okay it's like illustrator but free <laughs> and i learned with, with youtube videos um, but um something i always say is that the program is not the most important thing because you have you have seen a uh, a lot of comics in this presentation and some of them are done with illustrator others with inkscape and others with photoshop Okay, so the more the most important thing is that you, well, you have to find a program or a tool uh, which suits you. Okay, and this could be even a sheet of paper and a pencil. The well, the most important thing is being creative, and well, if you ha if you want to to draw comics. Uh, let them read a lot of comics uh, is very useful, of course. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very, very good answer. Thank you very much. Uh, because we're a little bit short of time, I'm going to pass to the next speaker, but we'll have a little round afterwards uh, to ask more, more questions and so on. So thank you very much, Miriam. And it's also very nice to hear uh, that you are there willing uh, to help if anyone uh, wants uh, help from you. So thank you so much. That's very kind. Thank you. See you later. So, well, now I'm going to introduce our last speaker, uh, Kike Gallardo, who is, uh, uh, let's say, a, a culinary researcher. Well, uh, Kike's talk is going to be in, in Spanish, but in the recording that uh, we will upload uh, in the following days, uh, we will add subtitles. And 
guys, if you don't speak Spanish, I still encourage you to stay because there's going to be a lot of videos that show uh, this uh, research uh, cooking and it's going to be very interesting. So I'll introduce Kike in, in Spanish in, in that case. So well, uh, Kike uh, hizo un, un grado en biología y luego hizo un máster especializado en, en biología sanitaria. Eh, Quique es un biólogo que decidió combinar eh, su conocimiento científico con la gastronomía y después de hacer una serie de proyectos ecológicos en área, en, en Asia, en, eh, en Sudamérica, eh, decidió empezar a estudiar cocina en Madrid. Y bueno, desde entonces, eh, Quique ha trabajado en muchos de los restaurantes eh, con mayor renombre eh, en diferentes sitios y además... Eh, trabajado como chef eh, en el seller de Can Roca y también eh, como investigador eh, de biología culinaria en el departamento de creatividad de la Masía y Maserre. Quique además ha, tenido, eh, ha sido galardonado con diferentes precio, eh, premios internacionales y está involucrado en una gran variedad de proyectos de los que os va a hablar. Eh, Quique, la pantalla es tuya, eh, inspira y enseñarnos qué es, qué es lo que estás haciendo. Muchas gracias. Vale, eh, vale perfecto. Pues nada, muchísimas gracias a ti. Eh, voy a compartir también pantalla. Para, eh, todo empieza eh, en, el, en el Océano Pacífico. El coronavirus me pidió allí, haciendo lo que más me gustaba, que era viajar, cocinar y, y bueno, pues descubrir y documentar cómo, cómo ciertas poblaciones se, se, se unen ¿no? a la gastronomía y a la cocina. El caso es que eh, cuando pasó todo, pues me cancelaron los vuelos y dejí, decidí quedarme allí. Más tarde tuvo que volver, pero en ese momento, pues, bueno, la zona de confort se había abierto tanto que, que me hacía gracia la idea de, de tirarnos al vacío, ¿no?, en, en un lugar así. El caso es que allí eh, viven unas, unas poblaciones que son los canas, que son las tribus indígenas, y que, bueno, pues aprendí muchísimo de, de esta gente y resulta que cuando haces la primera interacción con alguien, vas a su tribu por primera vez o te invitan a su casa, les haces una pequeña ofrenda que sirve para mostrar respeto, para mostrar humildad y al fin y al cabo para, para agradecer. Eh, todo lo que puede pasar durante la interacción. Entonces, en este caso, pues yo os quiero agradecer también todo lo que pueda suceder. Tenéis mi contacto eh, por ahí, sé que al final tenemos una ronda de preguntas y además, pues bueno, pues de alguna manera eh, os doy un poco de mi tiempo y mi energía ¿no? para esto. Aprofite también, perdonar desgracias a la, al Instituto de Ciencia Molecular de la Universidad de Valencia y también pues a la resta del, del, de los ponentes por, por la conferencia de, de hoy. Muchísimas gracias. El caso es que, bueno, pues... Os voy a hablar un poquito de un menú que yo hacía, que eran las cenas de Quique, lo hacía en 2018 y, y bueno, pues con esto me siento un poco más cómodo porque este menú de degustación contaba un poquito pues todo lo que voy a contar ahora y bueno, ya os hablaré un, un poco más de ese proyecto. El caso es que como soy cocinero, sé cocinar mejor que hablar, os he puesto un menú en el que voy a ir contando y me voy a ir apoyando en, en distintas imágenes de los platos para, para poder, bueno, pues hacer esta historia. El caso es que el primer plato es una certificación de salsiki con crujiente de falafel el salsí que es una crema de, de yogur con especias y cuando explota en la boca la verdad es que es muy agradable. El caso es que la, el calcio del yogur eh, combina con el aginato que tiene el alga, entonces se crea una película y al final pues esto es pura ciencia, cuando tú lo comes pues te explota en la boca. El, todo esto lo cuento porque antes de estudiar nada, cuando era menor de edad, estaba vendiendo comida vegetariana por ahí en diversos festivales de música y estaba un poco más perdido. ¿no? Mi madre me dijo que que estudiar una carrera que, que ya no pude estudiar y que después ya vería. Y entonces, en este caso, pues estudié algo que me permite juntar la cocina con la botánica. Esto es un herbario comestible, está impreso en papel de arroz, de tal manera que puedes ver la ilustración de, de la, del herbario, de, puedes aprender qué planta es y además después lo acompaño con el snack y así puedes degustarlo también. De alguna manera, pues me sirve para hacer esta divulgación científica de la que también han hablado mis, mis colegas. El caso es que cuando, cuando empecé biología era porque quería ser biólogo marino, a día de hoy el buceo es una de mis pasiones, pero claro, allí empecé a descubrir otras áreas, eh, la microbiología, que ahora me permite pues, entender mucho mejor los fermentos y hacer talleres sobre ello, la nutrición, que me permite hacer unos menús más saludables, la botánica, que me, me permite hacer platos como estos, la ingeniería genética o la biotecnología, que está muy presente en la industria alimentaria. Y el caso es que, bueno, pues poco a poco te vas enfocando más, quizá como, como también ha dicho mi, mi compi Miriam, a, a, a lo que es la, la investigación. Eh, fui a Francia, acabé haciendo un máster sobre biología sanitaria especializado en alimentación humana y ahí pues hice unas prácticas sobre, bueno, estuve, estuve investigando en el CNRS, que es como el CSIC, el Centro Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas, 
haciendo pues, bueno, investigación sobre nuevos fármacos para enfermedades autoinmunes, artritis reumatoide en este caso, que bueno, a mí me afecta de cerca, entonces como que, que estaba muy motivado con ello. El caso es que quizá la investigación no era lo que más, cuando, cuando llegué a, a, a estar dentro de allí, quizá no era lo que, lo que el cuerpo me pedía y decidí volver otra vez a, a viajar como, como había hecho años anteriores. ¿no? Me había dedicado durante muchos años a hacer proyectos de cooperación internacional y en este plato, que es un plato de, del mundo que teníamos en el seller, que gustaba muchísimo, pues ahí pongo también un poquito los, los snacks de los distintos lugares por donde yo he estado haciendo ese tipo de proyectos, ¿no? Por, por África, Asia, eh, Latinoamérica o, o Europa. Entonces, llegó un momento terminado en el que, en el que aprendí muchísimo, Esta fue un momento también de, de conocer otras culturas, de conocer otras personas, otras disciplinas distintas, y fui aprendiendo, ¿no? Como, como esta esponjita que se come. El caso es que en un momento terminado, eh, en Argentina, eh, me seleccionaron para hacer un proyecto con la Universidad de Granada, en el, que cual, en el cual 20 jóvenes pues íbamos a ir a recorrer ciertas regiones de los Andes durante un mes y medio y íbamos a hacer distintos proyectos. Pues había una médica que estaba enfocada en salud de esas poblaciones, había eh, un, un ingeniero que estaba tratando el tema de, de reciclaje y con, eh, monitores de tiempo libre que trataban con los jóvenes y yo pues en este caso estaba viendo un poco más cómo influía el tema de la alimentación. Tenía acceso al, al a, tenía instituto, a, perdón, Tenía acceso a la universidad y tenía acceso también al Ministerio de Medio Ambiente, pero no fue hasta que llegué a la cocina de estas poblaciones, a, a la cocina cotidiana, cuando entendí lo que significaba la soberanía alimentaria y lo que significaba pues, tener todo este tipo de, de variedades distintas de, de, de maíz, de patata y demás. ¿no? Con cada uno pues, hacían una técnica culinaria, hacían choclo, hacían harina de maíz, lo, lo freían, eh, con la papa igual, guiso de papa verde, tenían charqui, que era cómo deshidrataban los alimentos, ¿no? en este caso las carnes, pero también lo hacían con las patatas. Entonces, como que era muy interesante y por eso, eh, pues, en el menú en el que hago yo, tengo también una parte destinada a tratar ese tema en, en, con el resto de comensales. ¿no? El caso es que allí me di cuenta de que el cocinero era la persona que ponía en valor todo el trabajo que hace el planeta y todo el trabajo que hacen las personas que se dedican a la cultura de la alimentación. Y entonces decidí que si quería profundizar en, en la alimentación humana, pues que tenía que, que estudiar cocina y convertirme en cocinero. El caso es que cuando llegué a Madrid me matriculé en la escuela pública y hubo química, entonces me, me encantó la cocina, es algo que te engancha, empecé a, a trabajar en muchos lugares, a hacer recetas por la noche en casa, a prepararme muy bien los menús y bueno, pues fue un momento de, de no parar de trabajar de, en muchos restaurantes distintos y muchos ambientes. Y el caso es que eh, este plato que pongo es un, un bacalao al pilpil, es un plato típico de la gastronomía vasca, y es porque en un momento determinado gané una beca eh, a nivel internacional como uno de los mejores estudiantes de escuelas públicas de España. Me fui a trabajar al restaurante Aquelarre, en el País Vasco, el chef Pedro Subijana, tres estrellas Michelin, era como meter la cabeza en, en el mundo de la alta cocina. Y bueno, pues allí pasé por las distintas, distintas partidas. Eh, las partidas son como los departamentos en los que se divide una cocina, en este caso eran aperitivos, eh, mari eh, pescados, mariscos, carnes, guarniciones, eh, cuarto frío, pastelería... Y una vez que pasé por ahí, pues también eh, pasé al IMASD. El caso es que esta asociación de chef, que es una de las más reputadas en Europa, tiene como, como objetivo proteger la calidad y sabor de los alimentos, promover el buen hacer de los artesanos de la alimentación, promover el, el patrimonio culinario, y al fin y al cabo todo eso estaba ligado con, con la alimentación, que, que era aquello que, que también me, me, me gustaba. ¿no? El caso es que en el IMASD yo todavía no sabía ni cortar cebolla, estaba, estaba aprendiendo, y, y este chef me dio la oportunidad de, de poder estar ahí y aprender de, de su equipo creativo. Entonces le hice un regalo, era un herbario de las plantas comestibles que teníamos en el restaurante y esto bueno, fue hace, hace ya bastantes años, ahí estoy muy joven y bueno, pues es una idea que se me quedó en la cabeza de cómo poder desarrollar esta idea más tarde, ¿no? ahora os explicaré. El caso es que a partir de ahí gané otra beca a nivel internacional, al año siguiente fui a trabajar a Toulouse, uno de los mejores restaurantes de Francia, también por eso de entender esa, esa cocina francesa ¿no? tan tan bueno que ha marcado tanto el, el, la historia de la astronomía y eh, bueno chef Michel Sagan, entonces estrella Michelin, Toulouse, además jurado en Top Chef Francia, muy mediático y la verdad es que fue también pues un aprendizaje increíble que me llevó a, a cumplir los 25 años siendo jefe de cocina en un restaurante que había en París con mi propio menú que eran le tapas de Quique, ¿no? las tapas de Quique que, que luego ese nombre quedará un poco, un poco para luego. El caso es que eh, allí entendí que ser jefe de cocina no, no era igual que, que ser cocinero. Allí tenía que gestionar no solamente el menú, sino que gestionar la cocina, el stock, la maquinaria, recursos humanos, etcétera, etcétera. Y fue un año también de mucho aprendizaje, ¿no? De darme cuenta de lo que realmente implicaba ser un profesional de, de, de la cocina y de la gastronomía. 
Allí eh, mi, mi forma creativa, ¿no? mi, mi estrategia creativa para crear los menús era basarme en el producto de temporada. Después, por eso, en, en este plato hay una, una trufa negra, que es cuando, cuando era otoño y había ese, esa cantidad de, de setas. Luego, el producto como tal, investigar un poquito, a ver pues, si tenía calabaza, cómo se podía usar esa calabaza para hacer al horno, hacer una crema de calabaza, usar las pipas para hacer las garrapiñadas, quizá pues, el aceite de calabaza también ponerlo por encima. Luego, poco a poco, pues empecé a, a ver que había muchas tapas españolas que allí podían funcionar muy bien y hacerlas un poco a la francesa. Tuve que entender el gusto de los franceses. <risa> eh, después tenía panes, me obsesioné con los panes y cada carta tenía un pan y tenía que hacer una tapa distinta con, con ese pan. Y luego, por ejemplo, otra parte más fue darme cuenta de, de que los cocineros, de alguna manera, estamos muy vinculados a, a qué consume la gente, ¿no? Entonces me di cuenta que mis platos de mini hamburguesitas o... O de, o de pollo al curry con, con salsa de leche de coco, pues se vendían más que aquellos vegetarianos. Por lo cual intenté hacer dentro de cada carta platos vegetarianos y veganos mucho más elaborados y mucho más ricos, llamativos, para que la gente también los pidiera, ¿no? El caso es que este plato de aquí está también en el menú que, que hago aquí en las cenas de Quique y resulta que, que es un menú en el que yo explico que me comí el tarro en un momento determinado, que, que me rayé como esa trufa negra y que decidí, a pesar de todo, de estar en, progresando y en una situación más o menos cómoda y estable, volver otra vez a aprender. El caso es que este plato me, me ayuda para preguntar a mis comensales con qué cosas se comen ellos el tarro y que también lo compartan. El caso es que decidí irme de prácticas gratis a aprender al mejor restaurante del mundo, que es el Seller de Can Roca, está en Girona. Si no lo conocéis, es un restaurante regentado por, por tres hermanos, que es John Roca, Josep Roca y Jordi Roca. Cada uno es el mejor del mundo en su categoría, mejor cocinero, mejor sommelier y mejor pastero del mundo. Allí, además de la cocina tan espectacular que tienen, lo que me llamaba la atención era que tenían un equipo multidisciplinar detrás que les ayudaba a hacer toda la parte creativa, trabajaban con científicos, tenían un montón de proyectos paralelos que salían del restaurante, proyectos de botánica, proyectos audiovisuales, proyectos de cooperación internacional también, y era como, como un lugar increíble. Entonces allí, eh, a veces lo hemos contado, ¿no? lo, lo ha dicho Elena, que, que a veces pues, todo, todo se va uniendo, se saltean los alimentos, se mezclan esos sabores ¿no? y, y dan unos, unos matices nuevos en el plato. Y efectivamente es un poco lo que, lo que me pasó, que a las dos semanas pues, me contrataron por el hecho de ser biólogo, cocinero y haber estado en proyectos de cooperación dentro de, de ese espacio de creatividad que es la masía. Entonces ahora os voy a poner un vídeo que es muy interesante en el cual eh, yo entendí cómo se vinculaba también o se podía vincular la ciencia en un restaurante de este tipo. El restaurante ya no es solamente un lugar donde damos de comer, sino un lugar donde... Uh, pensamos, reflexionamos, formamos al equipo, planteamos nuevos proyectos, así que la masía es un lugar, un espacio donde pasan cosas que hacen que el restaurante crezca y que el restaurante tenga más recursos para poder seguir haciendo lo que queremos, ¿eh? que es cocinar y estar comprometidos con nuestra Perfecto. Muy bien, luego, luego os pondré un par más. Eh, el caso es que ahí me di cuenta, ¿no? De, bueno, este plato lo explica mejor, es que no te coman la olla, son unas lentejitas muy tradicionales, muy ricas que hago en, en los menús, y el caso es que ahí cuento un poquito de esto, ¿no? Que a veces nos han enseñado a trabajar de una forma muy concreta, nos han dicho que tenemos que ser especialistas en una sola cosa, y resulta que, como han dicho el resto de mis compañeros, cuando aprendes de otras, cuando te nutres de esas otras experiencias, ves todo un poco más amplio y al final pues, puedes hacer cosas como esta. Eh, el caso es que allí en el Seller tenían una parte creativa, una estrategia creativa muchísimo más elaborada y, y allí fue donde me di cuenta de que con la cocina se podían contar historias, todo tipo de historias. Allí tenían pues, eso, el academicismo, la memoria, la tradición, tenían el paisaje en la cocina, tenían magia, sentido del humor, ¿no? y tenían pues, 
dentro de, de, esa, eh, de ese equipo creativo venía Joan Roca, eh, venía alguno de los jefes de cocina, alguno de los jefes de imagen, y después el resto del equipo pues éramos eh, pues, científicos, había un químico, había ingenieros, había enólogos, había diseñadores de platos, yo estaba por ahí aprendiendo de toda esta gente, ¿no? Y la verdad es que fue un, no sé, pues para mí fue como cumplir un sueño, ¿no? El estar allí con ellos. El caso es que eso me llevó a mí después a entender que la ciencia también se puede contar a través de la cocina y que a la vez la ciencia puede ser una estrategia creativa más para desarrollar nuevos platos. Claro, bueno, aquí estoy con el, con el Rotaval, eh, justamente llegó a, a la vez que, que yo a la empresa, entonces, bueno, nos hicimos muy amigos, hicimos un montón de, de experimentos con ello. Y, y bueno, pues... Esta fue esa pequeña parte ¿no? en, la que, en la que me di cuenta de, de todo el poder que tiene, que tiene la ciencia y, y sobre todo de lo que es el método científico y cómo se puede aplicar el método científico en otras cosas. ¿no? En este caso en la cocina, pero se puede aplicar en muchas otras cosas más. El observar, el darte cuenta de cómo funcionan las cosas, el hacer las hipótesis. El, bueno, una receta súper fácil además ¿no? de, de pensar cómo te puede quedar el plato y después tener que reestructurarlo. Y la, todo esto la ciencia pues, pues me ayudó muchísimo. El caso es que ahora se pone otro, otro vídeo... Eh, otro vídeo de, de algo de lo que hacíamos ahí en el de lo que hacía en el seller, un vídeo muy cortito, hecho de mala manera, pero que se entiende también. Y esto fue, por ejemplo, intentar meter el paisaje en el plato, ¿no? Con, con la amapola. Queríamos sacar el color de la amapola para poder, para poder pintar un plato con estos colores, pero nos damos cuenta de que se nos oxidaba muchísimo constantemente este colorante. Entonces, en un momento determinado, eh, resultó que, que me di cuenta que eran antocianinas, que eran colorantes y pigmentos que, que responden al pH. Y en este caso, bueno, pues decidí extraerlo en alcohol, después en el rotaval, quitar ese alcohol, quedarme solamente con el pigmento y hacer distintos tratamientos en torno al pH. Al final, lo que conseguimos hacer fue extraerlo en, un, en una solución ácida, que era un vinagre de un vinagre que era ácido acético y de esta manera pues hicimos un gel de vinagre que quedaba bien rojo y ahí pues, fue, fue como pudimos conseguir este color tan, tan, tan apreciado. Perfecto. Perfecto. Bueno, otro por ejemplo, esto es un plato de los que tenían en ellos en el restaurante, es un ravioli de, tupin, de, de topinambur con, con lenguado, con las pieles del lenguado. El caso es que el topinambur es una especie de, de tubérculo muy chiquitito, la patata de, Jur, de Jerusalén lo llaman, y eh, nada, pues me puse a hacer pruebas con ello y resulta que, que me di cuenta que tenía inulina. La inulina es un conjunto de fructosas, un tipo de azúcar, y el caso es que cuando lo cocinas a baja temperatura, a partir de 85 grados para que se degrade la celulosa de, de, los, de las plantas vegetales, y al vacío, para que se conserve todo el aroma, pues puedes sacar un jugo de topinambur que si lo reduces a la vez en el rotaval, al final te queda pues una especie de textura como de miel, ¿no? Como un sirope con muchísimo sabor y que además a la hora de comerlo, pues como que se te hace en la boca, es como si fuera mantequilla y la verdad pues que fue muy interesante, ¿no? El, ahora mismo la industria alimentaria y también muchos restaurantes están usando la inulina porque tiene pues esas características organolépticas y también nutricionales y bueno, pues en este caso sirvió para aportar un matiz nuevo al plato. El caso es que también la, la, la biología y en este caso la nutrición, pues me permitió trabajar con, con Joan Roca y también con, con la fundación de los hermanos Gasol, con la Gasol Foundation, para hacer una serie de menús que eran, eh, bueno, para prevenir la obesidad infantil y promover los, los buenos hábitos. Luego, eh, la Universidad de Barcelona, por ejemplo, hizo un festival que era el CESTOM, que a, pues, justamente en paralelo con el CSIC, hacían un poco de divulgación científica a través de, de todos los tipos de tomate que hay. Eh, yo fui a dar una charla allí de cómo el tomate evolucionó, pero pues eso, como soy cocinero, pues lo hice a través de, de distintos platos, ¿no? contando las características de cada uno. El caso es que, por ejemplo, la ciencia también, en este caso, me, me ayudó a, a enfocar mejor y a poder llegar a, al plato que, que quería mostrar. El tomate amarillo, por ejemplo, tiene quercetina, que es un, un tipo de antioxidante que se degrada muy fácil con el calor y que además es hidrosoluble, por lo cual ya ese tomate como que te recomienda hacerlo en gazpacho o hacerlo en forma de salmorejo. Y poder contar esto, ¿no? Luego, por ejemplo, eh, los tomates rojos pues tienen licopeno, es eh, otro antioxidante que le confiere ese color rojo y que eh, aumenta su biodisponibilidad precisamente cuando se cocina y que se, cuando se cocina en presencia de, gra de grasas porque es eh, liposoluble. Entonces, pues de esta manera, pues al final el producto te lleva a cocinarlo de esta manera y hace una especie de escalivada y bueno, pues así puedes presentar y contar la historia de, de todas las distintas variedades que hay, ¿no? En este caso fue así. Luego, la gastronomía y la salud. En este caso estoy con, con Salvador Brugués, eh, una de las personas que más admiro de este mundo y uno de los mm, máximos exponentes de la, 
de la cocina a baja temperatura y al vacío en el mundo. Y bueno, pues fuimos a explicar precisamente estos beneficios eh, nutricionales de, de, la, de la baja temperatura. Allí también nos juntamos con otros expertos, ¿no? Aparte de médicos, estamos cocineros, nosotros del Seller Can Roca, pero había de la Fundación Alicia, de Alimentación y Ciencia, había del Nordic Food Lab, eh, que están en Dinamarca trabajando en investigación alimentaria. Entonces, de repente, pues un poco como ha dicho Elena, pues, eh, perdón, como ha dicho eh, Miriam, te juntas, ¿no? Este, net, este networking, esta parte pues, tan maravillosa con, con esta gente tan inspiradora y al final te das cuenta de que, de que hay otras formas, ¿no? De, de, de enfocar todo y, y, bueno, pues te motiva. Esta es mi amiga Andrea, siempre lo digo, se va a comer el mundo y es eso, ¿no? Es rodearte de estas personas que te siguen inspirando y que te siguen ayudando y que te dan otros puntos de vista distintos. El caso es que a partir de ahí salen las lluvias de ideas. Esto, bueno, es una especie de lluvia de, de azúcar para hacer una especie de crujiente, luego explicaré. El caso es que esta lluvia de ideas te, te ayuda a sacar nuevos proyectos. Cuando, de esto ha hablado también un poco Elena, de, de cuando tienes un objetivo, ¿no? Y de lo, de lo fácil que es, de alguna manera, visualizarlo, pero lo difícil que es llegar a ello, ¿no? Y efectivamente es porque los proyectos, pues, eh, son, se cocinan a, a baja temperatura, a fuego lento. Este es un tallín de cordero, se cocina a 65 grados durante 24 horas y al final, claro, pues que te quedas súper jugoso. Cuando, cuando vienen los comensales a mis cenas, pues lo tuesto y de esa manera, pues ya lo dejo preparado y perfecto para, para sacar. Lo único que los proyectos pasa parecido, tienen que ir poco a poco hasta que sea el momento perfecto para, para presentarlos. El caso es que eh, volví a Madrid después de, de estar unos seis años por ahí y, y me paré a, a pensar un poquito cuál, por qué yo era cocinero, qué significaba para mí el tema de alimentación. Eh, cuál era mi restaurante perfecto, para qué quería usar yo la cocina. Y entonces, un momento en que apunté todas esto, estas ideas en la pizarra, soñé con mi restaurante perfecto, le puse fecha, <ríe> y cuando pones una fecha a un proyecto, pues al final lo, lo acabas haciendo realidad. Os voy a poner el, el vídeo de, de las cenas de Kike. Para mí, la cocina es la felicidad de aprender, de sorprenderse, de, de encontrarse con los demás alrededor de una buena comida, que da valor a, a cada ingrediente, al entorno y a las personas. Y fiel a mi modo de vida, quise crear un restaurante nómada, que no está anclado a un lugar concreto. De hecho, hay que reservar para venir y hasta unos días antes no se sabe cuál es el lugar exacto donde vas a cenar. Además, solo abren periodos de tiempo concretos, solamente dos o tres meses seguidos, lleno la reserva, hago las cenas, paro, para viajar e inspirarme de nuevo. Son siempre por invitación los que, lo que las convierte en exclusivas y garantiza encontrar pues, gente interesante. Y bueno, pues la reserva se hace bajo, bajo reserva de un mes mínimo para poder organizar y conseguir que haya sinergias ¿no? entre las personas que van a conformar el grupo. Las primeras cenas, para saber si el proyecto era viable, incluida la del vídeo, se realizaron en el salón de mi casa, sin beneficio económico, pues para amigos y conocidos. Y a partir de ahí, con material audiovisual para enseñar, comencé a hacerlas en restaurantes pequeños con esa mentalidad de, de ganar ambos. Yo ponía la comida, ellos los vinos, hacía un menú para promocionar un producto suyo, me cedían al restaurante en los días que menos clientes querían tener. Y decidí pues, elaborar un menú de gustación exigente, creativo, que iba a ser la excusa perfecta para juntar allí a ocho personas inquietas e inspiradoras alrededor de una mesa. Ahí se iban conociendo a través de dinámicas de grupo, se sorprendían con la comida, se divertían, y mientras trataban pues, distintos temas, plato a plato, gastronomía, ciencia, arte, viajes, proyectos de cooperación, de tal manera que se generaban esos vínculos entre las personas. Además, la forma de hacer las cenas me permitía ciertas asequibles a nivel económico para muchas personas. La organización de que el grupo entrara a la vez, fuera el mismo menú para todos, todo con reservas, viendo con antelación quienes venían, hacía que la cocina fuera mucho más eficaz, sin desperdicio y bueno, me ocupaba yo, de, yo solo de cocinar porque preparaba todo el mismo día y de servir incluso. No tenía gastos fijos como tal y bueno, pues fue lo que yo llamo pues democratizar la alta cocina y usarla para buscar entonces otros tipos de beneficio, el social, el cultural, el ambiental, lo que ha llevado a que se desarrollen otros proyectos paralelos con gente de otras disciplinas con la finalidad de crear nuevas formas de comunicación que mejoren la sociedad. Y bueno, pues de alguna manera esto es el, el primer bocado de, de las cenas de Kike. Vale, perfecto. Pues efectivamente eh, todo lo que hice anterior a eso, todos los viajes que hice, todos los estudios que hice, las inquietudes que tenía, los, los lugares donde trabajé, pues fueron como, como el sustrato perfecto ¿no? para que las raíces de un árbol empezara, empezara a crecer. Eh, yo lo veo de esta manera, ¿no? Y ese tronco de, de ese árbol que, que va creciendo son las cenas que hice en ese momento y eh, a partir de ahí empezaron a salir ramas. Y, bueno, pues estas ramas son un montón de proyectos que es lo que, lo que a mí también me, me, me encanta, que es el, el poder hacer proyectos nuevos y, a ver, el hacer proyectos nuevos y en este caso eh, os voy a compartir un vídeo que es el, el vídeo de, 
de un proyecto muy interesante que creo que os va a gustar bastante, que es el herbario comestible. El herbario comestible es un proyecto de divulgación científica en el que dos biólogos nos hablan desde botánica, cada uno desde su punto de vista. Daniel Bustillo desde la pintura y yo pues desde la cocina. Durante este viaje artístico y gastronómico a través de los distintos grupos vegetales mostraremos cómo la botánica nos sirve de inspiración creativa y de vehículo para unir la ciencia, el arte y la cocina, sobre todo para crear concienciación ambiental. Hacemos charlas en universidades, salidas al campo, exposiciones artísticas donde poder explicar las curiosidades de estas especies y además degustarlas. Dani pues, tiene un proceso creativo muy interesante en el que nos cuenta por qué pinta las láminas de esta manera y yo pues, me baso en el paisaje, en las tradiciones, la ciencia, los sabores y las historias que rodean a, a cada especie vegetal. Las ilustraciones las estamos vendiendo a modo de postal y se recogerán en un libro que estamos editando con mucho cariño porque de hecho es un proyecto que nace de este cariño que tenemos por naturaleza. Y todo el dinero que recibimos de estas ventas se va destinado a financiar proyectos medioambientales. No solo para apoyarlos económicamente, sino para visibilizar las distintas formas de crear un mundo mejor. Vale, genial. Entonces, eh, a partir de ahí, pues os pongo esta lámina. Es una de las láminas que hacemos. Igual hay gente que la conoce o está, está sonriéndose en casa. Y, y bueno, pues el nombre eh, de Indica quiere decir la procedencia, dónde viene, que viene del centro de Asia. Y bueno, pues en la, en la nomenclatura del INMEO en, hay otra variedad distinta que es Sativa y que quiere decir domesticada ¿no? o cultivada. Entonces, con esto, eh, esta planta es mundialmente conocida y, y una de las más estudiadas del mundo, de hecho, por sus características farmacológicas, y nosotros pues, queríamos explicar también un poco eh, todo, todo ese sistema de cannabinoides que hay en, 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 el, en la cannabis índica. Entonces, en este caso, gracias a un poco al humor, también podemos llegar a más gente y, por ejemplo, pues ya hago este plato, que es un bizcochito de marihuana, eh, que bueno, lo presentamos y Dani pues, lo pinta al lado, abajo a la derecha, entonces, bueno, pues nos sirve un poco para llegar también a, a más gente. El caso es que después tenemos el madroño, por ejemplo, uno de los primeros que hicimos. Yo soy de Madrid, con esto lo cuento. Entonces, eh, el helado, pues resulta que es que en San Isidro es cuando empieza un poco la primavera y ahí pues tenemos ganas ya de, de, de un poco de fresquito porque empieza el calor aquí. Los siete puntos de mermelada de madroño y, y naranja que acompañan el helado de madroño y, y explican un poco que la, el oso y el madroño no es el oso, sino que es la osa y que esta osa viene de la constelación de la osa mayor, por eso hay siete estrellas. Y esas estrellas son las que después están en la bandera de la Comunidad de Madrid, por ejemplo. ¿no? Entonces también las historias nos sirven para basarnos un poco en contar estas cositas. Luego tenemos eh, el, bueno, pues el velo de novia, es una seta muy interesante que encontré en el norte de Tailandia, que no sé ni qué se podía comer, pero, pero resulta que sí. Ellos lo cocinan en sopas, pero yo decidí pues, darle otro uso y, y enterarme un poco de, de la ecología de esta planta, ¿no? de meter el paisaje en la cazuela. Entonces por eso pues, que hice este, este, este snack que se acompaña a, a la explicación y que, bueno, representa un poco ese tronco caído donde crecen estas, estas setas y, bueno, está relleno de un queso eh, fermentado que también está fermentado por otros microorganismos distintos, por otros, otros microhongos. Entonces, así explicamos un poco la, la gran variedad de, del reino fungi. Además, tiene un poquito de macha por encima, como si fuera ese musgo y, y demás. Luego tenemos la, la famosa amapola, en la que quisimos meter ese, esos colores en, en el plato. Y, bueno, resulta que aparte de, ese, de esos colorantes, tienen también mucha lecitina, las semillas, esa, esa lecitina también se encuentra, por ejemplo, en la soja, la lecitina de soja que usamos mucho en cocina, que se usa también para cuajar y hacer una especie de queso vegano que es el tofu de la leche de soja. Y aquí pues lleve el mismo procedimiento para hacer un queso vegano hecho de, de las semillas de la apola y poder hacer después este tipo de platos y explicar también que las plantas que tienen flor son las más evolucionadas ¿no? de todas las plantas que hay. El caso es que así podemos seguir con un montón de láminas más, con la trufa negra, hacemos una trufa, una mousse de trufa negra con avellanas crujientes por encima. ¿Por qué? Porque crece en simbiosis también con ciertos árboles, entre ellos el avellano. Algas, como el alga Codium tomentosum, que tenemos en, 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 el, en el mar Cantábrico, lo llevamos un poco pues, a esa cultura asiática que usa más algas y la freímos en tempura. Entonces, bueno, como que a partir de ahí tenemos nuevas láminas distintas que estamos investigando, por ejemplo, el higo chumbo. Hemos hecho ya algún experimento en el sello, pues investigué y me di cuenta de que tenía proteasas, que es un tipo de enzima que degrada otras proteínas. Entonces se pueden marinar carnes o pescados y encima se quede con ese, con ese color característico. Y bueno, pues a partir de ahí tenemos la gran familia que va creciendo de, de láminas del herbario comestible, que bueno, que efectivamente, pues como os he dicho, la estamos vendiendo. A partir de ahí haremos un libro, las charlas, eh, exposiciones y demás. Todo esto lo podéis encontrar en, en el herbario comestible, si buscáis. Tenemos un Instagram que estamos empezando y ahí empezaremos a subir toda esta información. El caso es que de esta manera, como también han dicho el resto de mis compis, eh, a mí me permite hacer divulgación científica a través de la cocina. Es algo que a todos los científicos es lo que nos gusta, ¿no? El poder compartir este conocimiento científico. Y aquí me di cuenta de que era, eh, pues, 
en varias direcciones, ¿no? No solamente que la cocina podía aportar la ciencia, sino que la ciencia también puede aportar a la cocina. Y a mí me gusta decir que yo también hago divulgación gastronómica. El caso es que hay otro proyecto más que ha salido, eh, no puedo contar demasiado de él todavía porque no me dejan, pero el caso es que estas cenas inspiraron a una productora visual a hacer un documental sobre seis personas muy inspiradoras que se juntan en una de estas cenas y que, bueno, pues a medida que pasa un menú parecido al que hago yo, de hecho, va a ser un menú concreto que yo haga para cada una de estas personas, pues ellos van a poder contar un poco quiénes son y poder tratar ciertos temas de actualidad que, que nos interesan, ¿no? Y todo esto ligado a la cocina. Entonces, son esos proyectos en los que, los que me, me gustan. Ya llegando a la conclusión, eh, estamos al final, vuelvo otra vez, igual que empecé con las islas, aquellas de, del otro lado del mundo, ahora me vuelvo a unas islas que están aquí cerquitas. Eh, este es un proyecto que se llama Ruta 7, es un proyecto universitario muy interesante, en el cual 45 jóvenes pues, recorren las Islas Canarias haciendo, eh, trabajando sobre los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. En este caso, el 2018 yo participé, ahí estoy dando una charla de botánica a ellos y al igual que, bueno, pues recibíamos siempre charlas y, y, y talleres, el caso es que uno de los coordinadores nos, nos hizo un taller en el que hablaba de cómo llegar a nuestros objetivos. Y entonces, en un mar de dudas, ¿no? cuando empiezas a ver a juntarte con ese tipo de gente y empiezas a tener más información, empiezan a salir islas chiquititas por ahí y, y el caso es que, bueno, pues ya puedes empezar a ver hacia qué isla te gustaría ir, ¿no? ¿Cuál es tu objetivo? Entonces, nunca es fácil, ¿no? Como ha dicho antes eh, Elena, ¿no? Que parece que es un... El camino nunca es fácil, pero, pero de alguna manera sí que, sí que puedes ponerte un objetivo y más o menos es fácil saber en qué dirección tienes que ir. Y eso se trata, pues, ir como las Canarias, que están en, en línea, pues ir a la primera isla, ver lo que hay en la segunda, desde la segunda ir a, ir a ver qué hay en la tercera y así poco a poco acercarte a tu objetivo porque quizá no es lo que te gusta, ¿eh? Ojito. El caso es que, eh, de alguna manera, si te desvías 45 grados hacia un lado o hacia otro, puedes acercarte poco a poco y además seguro que te acercas a algo que sí que te gusta, ¿no? Porque llegar a tu objetivo es complicado, nadie te puede asegurar esto, pero sí que vas a llegar a un lugar donde te guste si vas trabajando en esa dirección. Entonces, nada, somos como un molde, todo, los, todo nos moldea, ¿no? La, todas las cosas que vamos haciendo y, y poco a poco pues esto nos hace ser quienes somos y bueno, pues en un momento determinado ahora están saliendo nuevos proyectos, desde hace unos meses estoy, soy miembro de Spain Chef, es una asociación eh, española que es la liga culinaria, que hacen como competiciones, como la selección española de cocina profesional, como si fuera la selección española de fútbol, pues parecido, competiciones internacionales y aparte pues tiene una parte eh, de divulgación gastronómica, que yo la llamo, que es mediante exhibiciones y show cookings y talleres, pues acercar la gastronomía pues, a, a todo el público. Además, esta organización está dentro de una asociación mucho más grande, que es World Chef, que es internacional, donde están los mejores chefs del mundo, y ahí surgió hace unos años un proyecto que se llama el Feed the Planet, que se dedica exclusivamente a promover hábitos saludables en forma de gastronomía sostenible. Entonces, en este caso, en España, eh, bueno, pues os anuncio que con muchas ganas y, y bueno, motivación y, y, y respeto, eh, vamos a empezar a hacerlo y yo estoy en una de, de, de esas, de esa, bueno, pues en la junta directiva para, para llevar el proyecto a cabo. Entonces, pues poco a poco iremos subiendo más información y contando. Y el caso es que, bueno, pues a partir de ahí vienen los cuidados también, el, todo lo que significa sostenibilidad, no solamente es eh, en ese nivel más de, del ecosistema, sino incluso entre las personas. Entonces, bueno, pues todo esto me llevó a, a replantear muchas cosas y el año pasado pues eh, gané una beca para ir a un proyecto de los más sostenibles de, del mundo. Está en Almería, se llama Sunset Desert Technology y es un proyecto internacional donde estamos unos 20 personas conviviendo constantemente en forma de comunidad. Y bueno, pues tenemos, yo por ejemplo me encargo de todo lo que es la parte de, del huerto, ¿no? de la agroecología, de los alimentos. Después hay un departamento que se encarga de cómo gestionarlos y hacemos nuestro pan, nuestros fermentos, hacemos un poco todo. Y después hay otros... Eh, otros ingenieros que van a hacer más sostenible aún, ya no solamente cómo, eh, cómo recoger los alimentos o cultivarlos, sino a la hora de cocinarlos también, ¿no? Eh, todo lo que significa la sostenibilidad para ahí. Entonces, es un proyecto muy interesante. Eh, hice un vídeo hace poquito, está en mis redes sociales por si queréis verlo, que explica un poquito más esta parte. Y si no, bueno, tenéis mucha, mucha información en redes. Y, y a partir de ahí, así que acabo de verdad, este es el último postre del menú, no aparece en la carta, lo invito yo. Y es un cerdito que está hecho en 3D, la parte de arriba la sustituyo por azúcar y cuando lo pongo en la mesa pues se rompe y de alguna manera este cerdito pues, pues simboliza para mí el, el, las expectativas, ¿no? el ser alguien, el ego, que muchas veces nos, nos dieron desde pequeño, ¿no? el ahorra para ser alguien. Y resulta que en un momento determinado cuando te falla la salud o ver desgracias a tu alrededor, pues te das cuenta de que la vida solamente es una y de, y de que tienes que intentar 
ser feliz con aquello que haces y, y, y intentar hacer feliz también a los demás. Y que no, no hay que perder el tiempo con cosas que ni importan ni, ni aportan tampoco mucho. El caso es que, bueno, pues con esta pandemia creo, creo que todos nos hemos dado cuenta de esto. Además, pues a mí me pilló en el otro del mundo, dije que, que perdí los vuelos, al final tuve que volver porque mi padre falleció por otras causas, pero bueno, tuve que volver. Entonces, como que esas cosas te reafirman, ¿no? Este menú de 2018, estas ideas las tengo yo desde hace mucho tiempo más, pero todas esas cosas te van reafirmando en, en, bueno, pues en compartir con los demás y, y como todas las cosas buenas, este, este postre se comparte. Ahora con el tema del COVID no sé muy bien cómo voy a poder volver a hacerlo, pero el caso es que se comparte y, y nada, pues hoy quiero compartir con vosotros que soy un poquito más rico porque estáis todos vosotros dentro de mi cerdito y, y nada, pues muchísimas gracias, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Quique. Realmente para mí ha sido muy inspirador ver cómo has convergido eh, tus pasiones, como pueden ser pues, la biología, la cocina, la sostenibilidad, eh, de una forma tan creativa pues para forjar una serie de, de proyectos muy diferentes, pero que tienen una cosa en, en común, que es esa visión, y pues que además tienen un beneficio social, cultural y, y ambiental. La verdad es muy enriquecedor. Eh, ver todas, todas las cosas que, que se pueden hacer. Y, y bueno, aquí tenemos eh, una pregunta de, de Raquel que te pregunta si tú crees que sin tus conocimientos de biología y ciencia te podrías haber dedicado a la cocina de esta forma en, en la que lo haces. Vale, pues nada, muchísimas gracias a ti Isa y, y a Raquel la pregunto, la contesto. Yo creo que eh, cuando somos, yo me acuerdo cuando salí de la carrera que decía, bueno, yo no tengo ni idea. No, no tengo ni idea y creo que es un sentimiento que nos acompaña a todos. Pero luego te vas dando cuenta de que, de que lo que sí que tienes son herramientas. Son herramientas para, para poder aprender otras cosas y entender ¿no? todas esas cosas que pasan. Entonces, yo creo que, que podía quizá haberme dedicado a esto ¿no? si, si, si tuviera ese, esa motivación, pero que obviamente pues, el tener los conocimientos me ha acercado y me ha hecho acelerar mucho más rápido ¿no? y dedicarme pues, a algo que, que realmente me gusta. Entonces, bueno, pues quizá no hay que hacer una carrera en biología. Ahora mismo, de hecho, hay un montón de másters que están hechos de, de, bueno, pues, de ciencias gastronómicas, en el Basket Culinary Center, por ejemplo, en muchas universidades. Creo que en Valencia hace poquito tuvisteis una, un congreso sobre, sobre gastronomía y ciencia. Entonces, como que cada vez hay más personas que están interesadas en esto, pero es cierto que, que ya no solamente es por el conocimiento que tienes tú, sino por toda la gente del mundo científico que te puede ayudar para resolver estas dudas. Cierto, sí, muy, muy buena respuesta. Y en, y en este, esta línea me estaba yo preguntando también si cuando haces pues esas cosas de investigación de, de la cocina más puntuales, si has tenido o tienes eh, pues que, que estudiar y mirar en, en artículos o en, o en libros científicos pues el, qué está pasando con esas moléculas, por qué esta planta pues tiene eh, esta molécula concreta, qué, qué hace así. Entonces, requiere también una parte de, de estudio. Sí, de parte? hecho, eh, bueno, a día de hoy esto ha evolucionado un montonazo. Hay un montón de científicos que están investigando en ciencia, pero un montón, de hecho, pues hay un montón de libros también que recogen, hay incluso científicos que trabajan con cocineros y hacen publicaciones científicas también, el señor de Can Roca pues trabaja y da conferencias en Harvard de Science and Cooking, o sea que, que sí que, que hay un proceso muy interesante ¿no? y cada vez hay más información. Yo cuando me enfrento a, a crear un plato nuevo, pues, pues lo puedo crear desde muchas maneras, ¿no? para, para transmitir un mensaje, para bueno, pues, hablar un poco del producto y si es en este caso algo científico, pues claro que intento investigar de qué manera ¿no? se comportan esas moléculas, cómo puedo cocinarlo mejor, extraer eh, pues esas, esas cualidades y nada, pues al final la ciencia pues también ayuda como motor para, para guiarte a crear, a crear platos. Es muy interesante, desde luego. Y bueno, otra pregunta que yo creo que prácticamente todos nos estamos preguntando, vamos, ¿cuándo podemos ir a probar alguna de esas cenas de aquí que pone por aquí eh, Mónica Villoslada? Pues... <risa> Pues mira, de momento, obviamente, el tema de, de la pandemia del COVID nos ha, nos ha alterado a todo el mundo y, y bueno, pues en el sector de la hostelería, por supuesto. Entonces, nada, de momento, yo ahora estoy con otros proyectos distintos. Eh, las cenas, de verdad, las hago cuando, cuando a mí me surge hacerlos. Entonces, pues cuando me surja de nuevo volver a hacerlo y cambiar el menú y inspirarme para contar otras cosas, será cuando abra. Y nada, pues ir siguiendo un poco, pues yo sé, las redes sociales o lo que sea para, para poder ver cuando, dónde estoy y, y, y cuándo. <risa> Sí, sí, estaremos, estaremos pendientes. Mira, eh, alguna, pues nada. nada. Alguna cosita me saldrá por Valencia, puede ser, que por ahí algún colega mío cocinero que quiere participar, eso es lo que me gustaría, ¿no? Que en el futuro 
poder asociarme con otros cocineros y tener ese diálogo, pues ir a, ir a Valencia a hacer unas cuantas, ir a Barcelona y volver. Así que nada, si algún cocinero por ahí por, por medio que me escriba porque igual podemos hablar algo. Fantástico, pues nada, apuntaros. Si alguien eh, está interesado, escribid aquí. Pues nada, muchas gracias de nuevo. Con esto vamos a hacer eh, una última rondita todos juntos. Eh, con eh, Miriam y Fernando que siguen, que siguen por ahí. A ver si nos podemos unir. Y ya nos despedimos y... Y nada, nos vamos a, a comer, que nos ha entrado muchísimo hambre, a mí por lo menos. Ya estamos. Hola, buenas. Eh, bueno, pues, pues nada, con esto de despedir el seminario, hacemos esta última parte en castellano, ya que somos todos castellano parlantes y ya subtitularemos en la versión que se, que se suba online. Eh, pues nada, lo primero agradeceros de verdad el, el haber podido contar con vosotros, ha sido muy inspirador y también bueno agradecer desde luego a, a la Universidad de Valencia, al Instituto de Ciencia Molecular que han organizado esto, a, a Raquel Ballesteros de Comunicación, el Ruth Manzanares eh, de, de Management eh, y al director Eugenio Coronado y bueno como ya he dicho por supuesto a vosotros que aquí y que nos habéis llenado hoy este tiempo tan ameno y bueno, así de una forma general, eh, yo os quería preguntar, es una pregunta muy abstracta, ¿no? Pero digamos, eh, ¿qué es lo que a vosotros más os, os inspira o os ha inspirado a dar este paso y durante vuestra carrera? Eh, es una pregunta, entiendo, bastante abstracta. No sé ah, quién quieres bueno, que, que empiece. Sí, no sé quién quiere Le voy a dejar a Miriam primero. Vale, venga. Uh, bueno, a ver, um, a mí eh, me ayuda, o sea, me ayudaba y aún me sigue ayudando mucho eh, quedar con gente, con gente del sector, contarnos cómo nos va, contarnos nuestros proyectos, en qué estamos trabajando. Eso me inspira mucho eh, para yo también seguir y para también esforzarme en, en, seguir, haciendo, en seguir haciendo esto. Así que como, como he dicho muchas veces ya, qué pesada, eh, rodearos de, de gente buena del, de este sector en el, que, en el que queréis estar porque os ayudarán mucho. Toda la razón. Sí. Eh, estoy totalmente de acuerdo. El siguiente que queráis contestar. Yo, una de las cosas que, que me inspiran, ahora no sé si de algo consentido o no, porque la verdad es que la charla de aquí que me ha dejado con un hombre brutal. Y estoy pensando a ver si, si hace algún tipo de, de delivery o algo a, a Reino Unido, desde, desde donde sea que estés ahora mismo. Porque, madre mía, eh, pero... Pero una de las cosas que más me inspira de, de hacer comunicación científica es eh, un poco lo que estaba diciendo Kike, la oportunidad de, de contar historias a, a, a gente que no, que, que no las conoce y que les puedes enseñar un montón de un montón de cosas pues de lo que ha dicho, de biología, de química, de evolución, de, de un montón de temas que son apasionantes. Y, y sobre todo que más que enseñar las cosas, al final las aprendes tú. Pues un poco como ha dicho Miriam, que hace nada no sabía que eran los MOFs o no sabía que eran... No sé, pues vas aprendiendo conforme vas haciendo estas cosas de, de divulgación y a mí me pasa muchas veces que escribiendo artículos descubro temas completamente nuevos. El que he puesto en la charla de mecanoquímica y yo no sabía casi casi qué era ese campo y lo descubrí gracias a eso. Y investigar sobre temas nuevos y seguir aprendiendo es una de las cosas más chulas que, que, que se pueden hacer. Yo creo que es lo que más me, me fascina, lo que más me inspira de de este campo, además de la gente, que ahora es un poco complicado con COVID, pero, pero bueno, es otra de las cosas que la verdad es que, que ayudan a, a seguir adelante. Y ya yo creo que le dejo aquí que, que, que acabe con algún postre y, y ya está. No, pues sí, efectivamente, un poco lo que habéis dicho, eh, ser como, como un poco múltiple para saber que no tenemos ni idea de muchas cosas y de que, de que hay un mundo a nuestro alrededor, de hablar con otras personas que nos cuenten, que nos compartan qué otras cosas hay y poco a poco ir aprendiendo de, de todo esto. Sí que puede ser un objetivo, ¿no? pero, pero efectivamente siempre van a aparecer otras cosas que, que al final pues, te van a, a hacer crecer ¿no? de muchos aspectos y, y vaya, pues que esa es un poco la, la inspiración que yo encuentro, ¿no? También un poco pues, encontrarme con esta gente y encontrarme con, con cosas que yo no conocía y seguir aprendiendo. Bueno, también si puedo añadir algo más, el hecho de 
Vale, que yo no me he dedicado a la investigación, pero sí que sigo en contacto de alguna manera porque tengo compañeros que, que todavía se dedican, que hacen sus doctorados y de hecho tengo cómics en los que, eh, por ejemplo, en el 11F, que es el Día de la Mujer en la Ciencia, eh, hago cómics de historias de, de estos amigos míos, de estas amigas mías, que si una está en Oxford con su doctorado, que si una a lo mejor pues también tenía este problema de... Jo, es que ahora mismo yo quería hacer bioinformática, no he podido entrar en el máster de este año, pues de mientras hago no sé qué, ahora resulta que por fin tengo un doctorado, no sé qué, y es que mmm, a mí me ilusiona muchísimo ver cómo ellos van avanzando sus carreras y cómo, o sea, y para mí es un placer eh, coger y decir, te voy a hacer un cómic, porque es que lo explican con una ilusión, o sea, ilusión con la que te explican los científicos sus proyectos, cuando los tengo que transformar en cómic es que es, es algo súper bonito. Sí. Tiene que ser desde luego sí, muy, muy enriquecedor y bueno, con esto vamos, vamos a terminar también dando las gracias pues, a toda la gente que ha estado hoy aquí presente con nosotros, a los que a lo mejor lo vean a, a posteriori en la grabación y bueno, pues desde luego como, como ya he dicho a, a vosotros por estar aquí y a todo el Instituto de Ciencia Molecular por apoyar esto. Y bueno, yo también me quedo pues con, con una moraleja de, de, esta, de esta historia, digamos, es si hay ideas, si, si alguien quiere pues proponer a un webinar, cualquier cosa, a su centro de investigación, pues que, que lo hagan, porque bueno, como, como se ve, pues estas cosas eh, se hacen, salen hacia adelante y se convierten en experiencias muy enriquecedoras. Así que, pues nada, muchas gracias de nuevo. A lo mejor quizá, quién sabe, sale incluso pues alguna colaboración de diferentes ámbitos de, de esta charla, gente que a lo mejor eh, contacte pidiendo ayuda o asesoramiento o, o colaboración y, y pues, pues nada, seguiremos en, en contacto y muchas gracias de nuevo. Gracias a vosotros. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Gracias, hasta luego. Eh, Otro chao.